Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom everyone and as you may well have noticed now um, everyone is unmuted after we've just heard from Rabbi Eli Tikva Sarah um, following on from the sights of nature uh, we welcome you to this service variety of different people will be taking part and they will be unmuting themselves at the point where they uh, need to take part and then hopefully remuting themselves so that our technical host and technical guru leo mindel will not have to do much work chasing everybody but we hope that once we get into the service the amount of uh, choreography instructions that we have to give will be minimized and so everyone can enjoy this service and this experience together. After the service finishes and at a couple of points in the service you will be un invited to unmute and then if you do so please remember to remute yourself so that we don't have any extraneous noises. I'm not going to say anything more but um, I'm going to hand you over to Rabbi Tanya. Thank you, thank you very much, Richard. And Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It is a real honor for me to welcome all of you into our green Shabbat service this evening. All of us care about the Mother Earth and today we will be hearing moving personal reflections and poems from our lay leaders on some different aspects of this huge subject. Sustainability, healthy eating, shared resources, zero waste or renewable energy. That is only the beginning of an exciting conversation we are going to have through the whole evening. There are many different ways in which we individually can make the world around us a healthier and happier place. But together with our communities, our impact in that endeavor can be multiplied. So it is my pleasure to share the service tonight with four of my wonderful colleagues and the president of Liberal Judaism, Rabbi Andrew Goldstein, seven fantastic lay leaders of our communities and members of eight liberal congregations gathered together to celebrate our beautiful world and have their positive stand on issues that matter, not only for us, but for future generations as well. Thank you for joining our celebration of Green Shabbat and our beautiful world tonight. Let's enjoy it together and spread the message of life. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom and it's such a pleasure to be lighting these candles together with liberal Jews from Brighton to York um, across the country and from Lincoln to Bristol so really covering the whole country and coming together for this special Shabbat. As we light these candles to begin our Shabbat our special day of rest and reflection. We pray that our eyes may be open to the beauty and the wonder of God's world and that our hearts and our minds may be strengthened to tend and to guard our world. So that just as we keep Shabbat Lodorotam through all our generations, so for generations to come we will keep our precious world and guard it so that generations to come may enjoy it as we do.
We invite everyone, wherever you are, to join Rabbi Margaret in lighting your Shabbat candles this evening so that we may have the opportunity to fill the screens with a variety of different Shabbat candles. And then everyone can join in just one moment with the blessing together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam, Asher Kedushanu B'mitzvotah, Betsivanu Lahadlik Ne'er Shal Shabbat. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem HaShavet, Aleichem Yom. Mihi Melech, Aleichem HaMelechim, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Boahem Lishalom, Aleichem HaShalom, Aleichem Yom. Mihi melech melech hamalachim hakadosh baruchu b'chuni leshalom melech hashalom melech yom mihi melech melech hamalachim hakadosh baruchu. Sechem le shalom, malahe ha shalom, malahe yom. Vihi malach, malahe ha malahim ha kadush baruchu. During the last few strange months, many people are treasuring their time in the garden, out walking, cycling, jogging, dog walking. How fortunate all this kicked off just as spring was in the air. The bare soil, the naked trees, the seemingly empty plant pots gradually came to life as the first tiny shoots appeared, grew and opened. And this year, I've had the time an opportunity to watch. My weekly walk in Epping Forest has become a daily walk. I truly feel blessed to have watched the forest turn green and fill with returning life. How could I not feel connected and invigorated myself as the sun warmed the earth and the grass? The ferns, tree blossoms and wild flowers grew taller and denser and more colorful day by day. The resident songbirds and waterfowl were joined by migrant birds from thousands of miles away and together with the other wildlife have been busily pairing up and raising young. The air, the earth, the water is alive with life, all of it regardless of us and our concerns. They say you are closer to God in a garden than anywhere else on earth. The natural world is a place of awe and wonder, spiritual balm. This year, the Shehechi Yanu has had extra meaning for me. Every bracha is a moment of mindfulness, the chance to savour and appreciate. And I am truly thankful to the Eternal One for sustaining me and enabling me to reach this season. May all the peoples of this world be strengthened and redeemed by recognizing Earth's life-giving forces. Amen. We join together with Fiona, who just read for us in the Shehechianu prayer that we can all say for this special service and special time together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehecheyanu viki manu vihigiyanu lazman haze. Amen.
Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I'm here with Nigel. You can't see the top half of him yet. You will in a moment. The Hasids of old used to go out into the field as the sun was setting to greet the Shabbat as she, the Shabbos bride, as she came in. Everything else stopped. All the work was done. Everything was put away. The only thing left was to open arms, open hearts, and welcome in the presence of Shabbat. And I invite you to join us in singing L'chad Dodi. Do we know if we have Ellie, if she's been able to join us? It seems not. So perhaps we can move to the Barahu, which 
is going to be led by Sam and Ruth from York. Hello. So uh, we've managed to set up our camera so that we can stand and still be in shot. So if you're able to stand, then please do so. Um, and Baruch Hu is should be at the top of your screen now. Baruch Hu Adonai Amevorach Amevorach Meolam Ba'ed Amevorach Amevorach And we now hand over to Jack Wolf, who yep. is doing reading number three. Okay. Uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, I wrote this a couple of years ago after a trip to Cornwall. Um, I was walking with my son on Bodmin Moor. And I, I have a real thing for Bodmin Moor. I'm very fond of the place. And something that occurred to me while I was there really was at the... Uh, was that it's pre it's possible to feel the, the presence of God, I, I suppose, even in places which have been environmentally quite degraded, as Bodmin has. Um, so the, this poem, it, it kind of relates some of the feelings that I had while I was there. Um, I'll read it, and hopefully it will speak for itself. It's called Behemoth. We walk, the boy and I, up to King Arthur's Hall, over Lady Down from Penvorda in the mist. The footpath takes us through the scattered gorse, sheep haunted yellow flowers shivering on over enclosed land, enclosed fields, onto the cattle land. They are hardy breeds, highlands and belted galloways, long-horned, tough-coated, modern aurochs staring off into the distance stamping bullish feet, imprinting letter Bs into the smooth earth, breathing clouds. And we, the boy and I, we walk, maintaining a respectful space between ourselves and these, a space that whispers behema, the Hebrew word for creature, bet he mem he four letters brought to life by vagrant breath, ruach sown through sky. They turn their heads, heavy as boulders, as we walk, watching us through the damp light as we walk, across a mat of sheep's fescue, heath's bed straw, common bent, up to the forester's stockade, up to King Arthur's Hall, a place of sanctuary. Six hundred years ago, they say, that is, five clear-cut centuries before the trees came down to feed the smelting furnaces and power the beams, this mist-lit marsh was thronged with behemoth. Brown bear, wild boar, elk, lynx. So the cowherds commandeered this rectangle of ancient stones, this mortuary ground and built on it a pound to muster strays, complete with ten-foot palisade of wood and daub, thrown up on steep stone banks, set fire to frighten the night wolves, the wanderers. Now just the half-tamed cattle are kept out. Ungrazed, the heather sprouts bright crimson from the banks. White cotton grass wakens the bog beneath. We stay, boy and I, we stay just long enough to hear the silence breathing. That's 
we come now to the Shema. The tradition varies as to what people will do. And so if you wish to stand for the Shema to show your respect for the text, then please do. If not, remain seated and maybe you'll just rise in your mind. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad 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 Baruch Shem Kavod Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed Baruch Shem Kavod Shem Kavod Malchuto Le'olam Ba'ed Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Please join with me wherever you are. Va'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha v'chol levavacha v'chol nafshecha v'chol ma'odecha v'hayu hadvarim ha'ele asher anochi mitzavacha hayom al levavecha v'shinantam levanecha v'dibar tabam v'shiftecha b'veitecha u'v'lechtecha v'aderech u'v'shochbecha u'v'kumecha u'kashartam la'ot al yadecha v'hayu l'totafot b'neinecha Uchitavtam al mzuzot veitecha uvisharecha. You shall love the Eternal One, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Let these words which I command you this day be always in your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Speak of them in your home and on your way when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign upon your hand. Let them be like frontlets between your eyes. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Ellie Stanton is here now. I can unmute her. We'll be bringing Ellie in at a later point in the service rather than at the point where um, we are now in the service. So we, we have organized it. Thank you, Margaret. We've identified how to deal with it. But if Lucy would like to continue at this moment. Thank you. And Shabbat Shalom from Lockdown Leicester. Uh, I'm going to share with you a prayer written by the protest group Extinction Rebellion Jews for our uh, Tubishvat tree planting earlier this year at Sade, which is the new Jewish eco farm in Orpington in Kent. There is, uh, we discovered, no traditional uh, Jewish prayer that fits planting native woodland trees in the UK. So please feel free to share this when you're next out planting. May it be your will that the trees we plant today flourish and grow strong. May each truly become a tree of life a life-giving source that for many more years transforms our carbon dioxide into oxygen and cools the earth, providing habitat and abundance for all. Lord our God, you made this beautiful world and gave it to us to enjoy, explore, and most of all, to protect. May planting this tree help to heal the damage our species has done to the life support systems upon which all creation depends. May it inspire others to plant trees and protect forests and keep the communities already doing so around the world safe from harm. May it send a message to our descendants that we did indeed understand the impending threats that we face from climate change and deforestation, and that following our Jewish tradition, we chose to plant trees 
so that they too may have a future. Amen. We have arrived at the central prayer. The rabbis of old called it simply Hatzifila, the prayer. On the one hand, it's a communal prayer. On the other, we're invited to approach God as individuals. Eternal one, open up my lips that I may declare your praise. In some traditions, the Amidah is recited twice, once in silence as a personal prayer, and once communally. This is not the liberal tradition, but as the community prays together, each individual is invited to find their own moment for personal prayer. According to the Talmudic sages, the Tefila was to be recited while standing, hence one of its names, Amidah, standing. Individuals may choose whether to remain standing through to Ose Shalom or to sit after the Kedusha, the third blessing. And we're going to be reciting the first three blessings together. Um, I'm going to be singing them. Please do join in. And then we will be reciting the rest of the Amidah in silence. And those who are able to, please stand. <laughs> Yalla la 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 so fatai tita Yalla la 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 you fiagi u fiagi te hilate ha Yalla la 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 aduna Yalla la 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 so fatai tita Yalla la 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 you fiagi Ufi agi tehilate ha. Baruchat Adonai, Eloheinu, Elohe avoteinu vimoteinu. Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzchak, Elohe Yaakov. Elohe Sarah, Elohe Rivka, Elohe Rachel, Elohe Leah. Ha'el ha'gadol ha'gibor v'hanor ha'ha. El Halyon, Gomel Hasadim Tovim, Bukone Hakol, Bazoher has their vote for my heart, maybe Gula live never nehem, Lema on Shemo, Be Ava, Mele Jose, Moshia, Umagi, Baruchata had on I, Magain Avraham. Atagi bol or lam adonai, Machaye matim ata rav la hoshia, Mashib ha ruach morid ha geshem, Mazria ha shemesh, morid hata. Machakir ha him behesed, Machaye matim, Berachamim rabim, Samach nafalim rafe holim. 
Matir asurim, mekayem hemunato, lishene hafa, mi hamoha agurot, umido melach, melech me mi tu mechaye, umat miach yeshua, bene emen ata, ahayot me ti, baruch atahadonai, mechaye, Please join in singing with me these beautiful words of Hannah Senesh, that these things never end, the sand and the sea, the rush of the waters, the crash of the heavens and the prayer of the heart. <laughs> The narrow top of the brick wall dividing my neighbor's yard from mine is a little strip of pure wilderness. I prune it back gently once a year or so and do a little wildlife inventory while I'm there. This year I found 15 different plant species growing on the wall, including three types of tree. As much as I cherish my garden, I can't help but notice that the pollinating insects often prefer the weeds and the blue tits love to pick tiny insects out of the wall. Isabella Tree in her book, Wilding, writes that conservationists, and I would argue gardeners, are only beginning to value what has been considered scrub. Quote, the champion of margins, scrub itself has been marginalized, exiled to the no man's land of railway sidings, slag heaps, spoil tips, etc. Ironically, it is these shunned, overgrown, unprotected places that are now notable for wildlife, bastions for species on the verge of extinction across the country. 15% of all nationally scarce insects are recorded from brownfield sites, some of which have now been designated sites of special scientific interest. Conservation groups like Bug Life find themselves in the bizarre position of petitioning for the preservation of post-industrial areas for wildlife, while our so-called greenfield sites, supposedly protected from development, have close to no wildlife value at all. That brings us to reading on the bottom of page 14. Still now our world is incomplete. Still now the hunger of many continues night after night. Still now the cruelty of some causes pain to many. 
Still now, color, race, and religion are tools of division and fear. Still now, politics and greed overrule morality and justice. Still now, we must pray and work for a better future. And then all that has divided us will merge. And then compassion will be wedded to power. And then softness will come to a world that is harsh and unkind. And then both men and women will be gentle. And then both women and men will be strong. And then no person will be subject to another's will. And then all will be rich and free and varied. And then the greed of some will give way to the needs of many. And then all will share equally in the earth's abundance. And then all will care for the sick and the weak and the old. And then all will nourish the young. And then all will cherish life's creatures. And then all will live in harmony with each other and the earth. And then everywhere will be called Eden once again. Death cannot sever our connection to those we have lost. The soul is eternal and can never be extinguished. But not only the soul survives the grave, the bonds of love are stronger than death. The lessons that our loved ones taught us, their goodness, their deeds, their wisdom, will remain with us always. They have left a permanent imprint upon our souls that can never be erased. They continue to guide us wherever we go. And I invite you, if you wish to unmute yourself and say the name of someone you are remembering or post them in the chat. The unnamed child of Amanda Bedford. My brother, Brian Benjamin. My, my, my parents, um, Sheila and uh, Israel Orchula. Uh, Jonathan Brostoff. My husband, John Crawford Palmer. My father, Eric Strauss, who passed away 20 years ago today. My great Andrea. My cousin David Green. My father in law, John Finkel, whose yard sites today. Zifranam Livracha. May all those who we remember as we hold them in our hearts, may they be source of blessing and inspiration and strength to us. Please join in Kaddish if it is your custom to unmute, custom to join in. The fire Amen. All Israel and all humanity, and let us say Amen.
point, those who have been standing may wish to be seated once more as before we can move to our concluding song, we have a piece that was prepared by Ellie Stanton from Birmingham. Ah, hello. Can you hear me now? Not sure. Um, I yes. Think most of, yes, you can. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, I think most of what I was going to say has already been said by other people making, ex you know, ex extremely important points. Um, I did want to retell the story of Honey the Circle Maker. I think everyone's heard it, but I think we should um, include it in the service. It's, it's kind of quite unique. As we know, Honey was thought to be somebody who was specially loved by God. He would draw a circle around himself and refuse to come out until the rain came. Uh, and, uh, and, and it rained. Uh, so obviously God had a soft spot for him. And he was walking on the road one time and he saw a man planting a carob tree. And he went up to the man and said, <clears throat> Don't you think that's a bit presumptuous planting a carob tree? You're not going to live to see the, to collect the fruits of the carob. And the man looked at him and saw it was honey and said, um, uh, no, but when I came into the world, there were carob trees with fruit. Uh, and uh, that's why I'm planting this carob tree for the people who come after us. Um, and I think um, that point has been, been made already, but uh, I, I think that's the essence of why we think it's important to have a green Shabbat. Um, I think our Torah gives us a very strong and vivid link between the now and the time when our ancestors were much closer to nature than we are. Um, and... I won't, uh, uh, I won't go on for too long, but not only that, it gives us an insight into the attitude of the people who wrote the creation story. Uh, there seemed to be a, a sort of unspoken assumption, um, I create you name. In other words, the Almighty was saying, what's the point of my slaving way making all these creations? If there isn't somebody intelligent to look at it, to admire it, to appreciate it, and to acknowledge it all by giving each of my creations a name. So I think what we need to decide very urgently really is whether we appreciate the world that we're living in or not. Uh, and if we are, we decide that we, we, we are going to appreciate it, we need to, look after it uh, and not take it for granted. And that was really, I think, everything that I was going to say that hasn't already been said. So thank you. Thanks to Ellie for those comments. We come now to our closing song, uh, which will be led for us um, in Nottingham by Solly and Karen Worth. Hey, Max. And Max. Audio Shalom Aleinu. Audio Shalom Aleinu. Audio Shalom Aleinu Ve'akura Odiyavo Shalom Aleinu Odiyavo Shalom Aleinu Odiyavo Shalom Aleinu Ve'akura Salam Aleinu Ve'akura Salam, 
on Earth Day, which was the 22nd of April, 2020. And it was written as part of a series of poetry called Poetry for a Pandemic. And this particular poem was written specifically for businesses, but I believe it has resonance for all of us. As the people gasp for air and the planet starts to breathe, as we stay inside our homes, a new economy we weave. As we value our key workers, and priorities shift. Our lowered carbon footprint helps the smog to lift. As we see the world more clearly and adjust to a new pace, now business as usual no longer has a place. As those willing to face the future embrace a change for good, let's create for people and planet, show the pandemic's lessons are understood. Let us rebuild our society, act together to survive, put community and planet first, and our economy will thrive. Thank you so much, Benita. It was beautiful. And um, thank you every mu very much, everyone who took part in the service and everyone who joined us today. And now we are almost about to conclude our service, but it's not the end of our evening. And I will be concluding our service with a blessing. May God bless us and protect us. May we see the light of God's creation shining on us and within us. May we live in harmony with the world and may we have peace in our minds and in our lives. And let us say, Amen. And I will conclude the blessing with the poem called The Beginning by Rachel Kahn. If you can find stillness, the jasmine will night bloom in your direction and the breeze will carry its sacred exaltation of perfume toward you. Breathe. The moon will cascade waves of radiance downward. Drop her silver robes, glow. You will awaken, overtaken by a love that asks no permission. Golden particles rising beneath your skin. All of existence longs to be an offering. Eternity is a constant whisper, wishing to be listened to. This is the beginning. This is only the beginning. Let it in. And at this point, I would like to invite Rabbi Richard to continue our service at the end of our service with Kiddush. Thank you, Rabbi Tanya, for those beautiful closing words. 
and I'd invite everyone wherever you are if you have your kiddush cup or glass of wine or grape juice or whatever it is you're drinking this evening to duet or form a trio or a quartet depending on how many people are in your homes this evening with me as we do so with nearly um we have through the service had around a hundred screens on zoom plus we're streaming to a number of different places so i'm hoping that everyone will join together in welcoming shabbat and sharing the joy of shabbat in kiddush <laughs> Vayichal Elohim bayom hashvi malachto asher asa Vayishpot bayom hashvi mikol malachto asher asa Vayivarech Elohim et yom hashvi maikadesh oto Kivo shavat mikol malachto asher bara Elohim lasot Baruch atarunai Eloheinu melech haolam, borei peri hagafen. Amen. Baruch atarunai, Eloheinu melech haolam, ashe kirishanu b'mitzvotav v'ratzavanu, v'shabbat kodsho, v'ahava uvratzon hinchilanu, zikaron l'masei v'reshit. Ki hu yom techila le mikrae kodesh zeche litziat mitzrayim ki vanu vacharta veotanu ki dashta mikol hamim v'shabat kotshecha v'ahava uvratzon hinchaltanu Baruch atadonai mekadesh ha-shabbat. Amen. L'chaim and Shabbat Shalom to everyone. And we move seamlessly from North London to Bristol so that Rabbi Monique can lead us in making mozi. So, uh, everybody get their bread ready. And uh, before we do hamotzi, I have a, a blessing from Ritual Well. It's a sustainability mozi. Blessed God of our ancestors, beginning the chain of work, we give thanks. For the portion of dough, we take off the challah before we bake it in order to sustain high priests, artists, and those who are in need. For the seed and the earth and the rain and the sun and the farmer and the picker and the miller and the baker and the trucker and the packager and the store owner and the grocery checker and the shopper and the cook and the waiter and the waitress and those who will clean up after us for those who brought us this food that we bless together. For the scientists and activists and the teachers and the learners and the new farmers and the leaders who work to help us heal this earth, our home. For all those who work to sustain us for all those who work for sustainability, we say together, Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Hamotzi Lechem Min HaAretz. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Monique. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And thank you so much to our wonderful lay leaders of our communities. Aren't we lucky, all of us? It's been an amazing, an amazing evening and it's a great start to our evening. Now is the time for you either to get your dinner, if it's ready, or try and cook it very quickly while tuning in. Or for those of you who have done it both, can join in into the discussion, which will be led by Benita Matovsky. 
Benita Matovsky is a very special lady and she is a member of Brighton and Hope Progressive Congregation. Benita is a speaker, change maker, author of the book Generation Share and founder of charity The People Who Share and Global Sharing Week. So it is very clear by now that Benita is very passionate about sharing. And now she will talk about social impact of shared economy with allowing some time at the very end for both your questions and your own personal ideas and sharing your own passions about green living. Thank you so much. And Benita, thank you so much for agreeing to lead our discussion social time. Everyone, you can unmute yourself just for a few seconds to say Shabbat Shalom. And then Shabbat, we'll shalom. Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. 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 Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I'll see you later. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're off to eat now, but we may join you later. Thank you very much. Lovely Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'll be back for half an hour. Thank you. Lovely. Shabbat 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 yeah, I'll be Thank back you. soon. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom from Birmingham. Bye. Shabbat Shalom. Lovely. So can we please now mute everyone just for a, for a few seconds, for a few, for a few minutes, while Benita will do her introduction, and then you'll be very very welcome to first to post your questions in our chat box or on uh, uh, certainly not in the synagogue uh, Facebook group because I can pick up them from there and we will start we will start our discussion and our social time because it will be wonderful to hear your opinion on the shared economy as well after Benita will finish her presentation. Thank you very much and Benita it's all yours. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's an absolute honour and a privilege to be here and to be part of this really lovely special evening. I just, you know, I feel quite overcome really with some of the beautiful readings that we've had so far tonight. And so my passion, yes, is about building this idea of a caring, sharing economy, because we have enough resources to go around. You know, we each year we waste a third of our food and we have enough food to feed the global population who live in food poverty three times over. We have enough housing to house those who are homeless 10 times over. And when we look at our resources, there are over 3.5 trillion pounds worth of idle resources worldwide. In a sharing economy, waste is simply resource in the wrong place. And that's really been my passion and my mission is to find ways in which we can inspire people and enable people to share those resources. Because when we do that, what we do is we create a sustainable economy where surplus meets need and where we each enable each other to build a caring, sharing society that is equal and that is fair and that is open and that is happy and that is well. And so really that's my mission. And I define the sharing economy very simply as a way of life where we share available resources in any way that we can and we care for people and planet. It's a socioeconomic system that's built around the sharing of human and physical resources. Because although our planetary resources may be finite, our potential to share is unlimited. And so if we can unleash that, there's really no end to what we can achieve. Four years ago, I set out on a journey to tell the inspiring stories of the change makers worldwide that are building a more caring, sharing society. Because I believe that to change the world, we need to change the narrative. We need to tell more positive stories, stories of hope, stories of transformation, stories that demonstrate that changing the world is possible that people, whatever their means and from whatever their humble backgrounds may be, are able to transform the world in which they live. One such change maker is a woman called Artie Naik who lives in the slums in southern Mumbai, one of the biggest slums in Mumbai. And she set up the Saki School for Girls to enable girls to have an education. 
the world over, I've traveled to over 30 countries for my book, Generation Share, which demonstrates that by bringing these positive stories, we can create these ripples, these inspirational stories that demonstrate that change is possible and change is happening. And, you know, we hear the news every day and we hear a lot of negativity. And I believe that a key factor of the sharing economy is about positivity, is about creating this positive narrative because it's negativity that destroys our malfunctioning world. And so I believe that together and by enlightening people and by enabling and inspiring and giving visibility to these positive stories of the sharing of resources, we can solve our climate crisis. I think one of the things that's been really interesting about this pandemic, and I'm really keen to hear people's views on this, is the fact that we demonstrated that we could change our lifestyles. We were able to stop flying around the world with a 95% reduction in flights during March and with traffic reduced to the levels of 1955, we demonstrated that we were able to tackle this climate crisis. We've seen some extraordinary things happening worldwide. We've seen blue skies over Delhi and Shanghai. We've seen fish in the canals in Venice and the world over here, you know, in Brighton where I live and many parts of the UK, it's not surprising that we've enjoyed this beautiful weather, that we've been able to, while we've been locked down in our homes, we've been able to appreciate and spend time in nature because we've taken that time to stop, to cease our hyperconsumption and to really consider what we actually need for our lives. And so my question to all of you, and I really welcome, this is a discussion, I'm really keen to hear these views, are what can we share? What can we do to create this more equitable society that's built around the sharing of resources? And I'd love to hear some thoughts about perhaps things that you're doing in your communities, perhaps actions that you've taken, perhaps challenges that have, have come up for you during this pandemic, and just some thoughts about some of the challenges around sharing too, because of course there are challenges. So I welcome all questions, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, comments. You will need to unmute yourself if you would like to say something. Hello, I'm Sharon Law from um, East London and Essex Synagogue. And the sentiments of the positivity is beautiful and I share positive affirmations and a lot of things every day. Um, I've obviously, like a lot of people, have been spending a lot of time in in nature and you know doing things that are are beautiful. But I have concerns now because with this insistence on masks, there is a growing problem with these not reusable masks filling up landfill and people who are now going back you know even in the parks or the beaches seem to have forgotten what bin is and I'm just wondering how as communities we can try and help our local communities <clears throat> remember things that they seem to know before but seem to have forgotten in the time that maybe they've not needed to remember it. I hope that made sense. <laughs> Sharon, I think you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things that's been, you know, that's been absolutely, that has been shocking is the fact that, you know, I know here in Brighton, the day that um, the 15th of June, um, when shops were able to, non-essential shops were able to reopen, you know, there were queues outside of Primark from very early in the morning. And, you know, and other such um, fast fashion um, places were, you know, were witnessing the same thing. So I think you're right. We've also seen a, a huge increase in litter during this time. And that is very, very concerning. Um, but this is Plastic Free July. And we have an opportunity to really put our, you know, our energies and our passions behind this campaign. Each of us can make an effort during this month to be plastic free. It's not easy. You know, we go to our supermarkets and so many of the foods that we purchase are in plastic or wrapped in plastic. But I think having a month that really raises these kind of awareness, we can really think about and be more conscious about what each of us can do. Because I believe that to share is to be human. And it's, you know, the change starts with each of us. 
And right. every day I, I've, I've been working in this space for, you know, over a decade. And, and I always say to myself on a morning, what can I do today? What can I share? How can I be better? Because we can all be better. And I believe that the change starts with each of us. We can all do something. So let's get behind Plastic Free July and say, how can we minimize plastic? Because look, it's, you know, it's wrecking our world. It's destroying our oceans and the life in our oceans. And there's so much that we can do. So I think it's an opportunity to really focus on the positive, whilst I absolutely agree that there are lots of concerns about the disposables around all of the materials and the, the things that we need to protect ourselves during this pandemic. But each of us can wear, you know, a reusable mask. We can take our own actions and influence those around us because that's really all I believe that we can do. Thank you very much, Benita. Has anyone else got a question? So we've got a comment from Sharon Law. She says that the positivity is my motto and I share a positive statement each day. Spending time in nature is beautiful, but now it's, the problems are probably really facing, um, you know, the, the basically... To, Getting, getting everything what we polluted uh, clear, I guess that's what, what Sharon means. Has anyone else got, got a question or would like to share their thoughts? Hi. Janet, Janet, say please. Hi, um, hello, hi, Benita, it's great to see you. Um, I was just, I mean, one of the things when I, and I've heard you speak before, is you talk about sharing and I find giving quite easy. You know, and like I know that like because the synagogue's closed, we don't have the box to take to Voices in Exile. So like I've done some, I've taken them some stuff and things like that. And I'm just interested in your thoughts on the different like giving versus sharing or, or is it a versus? I don't know, but your thoughts on that. Well, it's interesting because, you know, I, I used to describe sharing as sustainable giving. But actually, really, when I think about it, when we all think about it, if we're really honest, when you give something, you always get something in return. When you take something to that box of Voices in Exile, Brighton and Hope Voices in Exile support refugees across the city. And at our synagogue, we every week we have a collection and it's, you know, it's incredibly important and needed and appreciated by the refugees in our city. And I think if we're if we all think about that deeply, whenever we give, we always get something in return. And so I, I now, you know, I, I used to think that there was a real distinction between sharing and giving but now I'm not so, so sure other than I think when I talk about sharing sharing is something that's very mutual it's absolutely two-way but the first step to being able to share is to be able to trust because if we can't trust we can't share and that's an incredibly important part of it and so I think that you know it's sharing is very deliberate isn't it it's very overt you know we're making this conscious decision we're saying that we're also laying ourselves bare because by sharing, we're saying, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving something else, of, of, I'm sharing something that I have, but I'm also demonstrating that there's something that I need in return. So there's an element of that vulnerability. And I think that's, you know, that's really important. But I, I do believe that, you know, it's very much by acknowledging that in the first instance, we need to be able to trust because once we can trust, we can share and we can give. Um, thank you. I am living, I'm living, I am the only black person living among in all of us around here. Uh, English, I'm the only black person. And as you heard me say before, my husband died in March. Anyhow, there are people here where their husband is suffering from COPD and um, they have to be in lockdown. I have to be in lockdown as well. So when I get my groceries, I share it because I don't want to have to throw away, have things that I have to throw away because I, I don't like that. I don't like throwing away food and so on. So I take my part of my grocery and I give and the lady said to me, why are you doing this? And I said to her, you know, we need to go back and live the way we used to live, as you said, in the fifties, we need to go back and live when each person, we were living on the same street and you could go to the person and you can ask for a cup of sugar or whatever. And it was given to you without any, um, I want it back or anything like that. 
And I was surprised because I've lost a lot of weight and I've got some clothes that I was going to, I thought, I can't take it to the charity shop. The charity shop is closed. And she said to me, I love it. I said, you sure? And she said, yes. Even bra she take from me. And I was shocked. So, you know, I, I agree that we need to go back and start sharing and start living simple and stop going to the supermarket and buying all these things and we can't eat them and we throw them into landfill. And then you got all that going up into the atmosphere. I agree. So... Although I'm on lockdown because I am ill, but I still try to do my little bit. Ivana, I, I, I think that's, you know, what you've just said is, is, well, it's just so, I'm sure it resonates with so many people here. You know, the fact that absolutely, I think about, you know, I think about my grandma, Oliver Shalom, and, you know, I think about how, you know, she always talked about that everything was shared. You know, that, that whole idea of what, what's really ownership, you know, you needed something, then, you know, you, you, you found it, you know, from your neighbor or the other neighbor. And, and that was just part of, of, of what you did, you know, to share is, is to be human. And I think you're absolutely right. I think part of this is that we've forgotten. We've forgotten how to share and we need I, to, to, yeah, to remember. I, we need to remind I remember us. when I used to walk to walk a mile over here, a mile to the market to get my stuff and walk back. I didn't take the bus, I walked. And it keep me fit and slim and, you know, all, I miss all those things. I'm so glad I live out in the country. I live in a village, I live out in the country. And although I was told that I have to shield, I still walk down to the river and stand there on the bridge and look and I see all the wildlife, the butterflies and everything like that. And I thought, I am so fortunate. I wish people in the city was fortunate to see all this and appreciate it. I see the cornfield and everything. So, you know, as you said, we need to get back to basic. And is this what the pandemic is telling us? That we need to get back to how it was before and stop being so greedy and selfish and, you know, buying things and then put it in the freezer, in the fridge, I mean, and then when it go bad, we throw it away. When we used to go down to the grocery shop, the, the grocery, I'm talking about when I came to this country, and the green grocer, we go and we'd buy just exactly what we want to use for that day. We didn't buy any bulk thing, we just buy what we need to use. And that was that. We didn't have anything to throw away. Can I ask if on where you are in the country? Because you're I'm an absolute blessing in, to that place. I'm living in a village named Barclay. Have you heard of Barclay Castle? I have, yes. Yeah, I'm living 10 minutes walk from the castle. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you very much. Has anyone else got to share their personal experiences? I'll start with their passions or I've got a question for Benita. Hello, I'm I'm Janet. We're from Brighton, sitting here eating our Shabbat supper. Have Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I just wanted to say that two years ago, we decided to try plastic free July. And we thought four weeks, we can do it and we can see how we get on. And then we can decide at the end of it what it is we're going to keep and what it is that we simply can't live with. And to be perfectly honest, the only thing we couldn't live with was the toothpaste. <laughs> and actually, we're probably, as a result of that, we're pro we've probably gone to about 80% plastic free and gone down to sort of one small carrier bag of rubbish a week in our house. Yeah. yeah. Actually, yeah. we have the time and we're lucky in that we have, you know, we could afford to be careful and we expected it to come out as more expensive. And I have to say it didn't. It means we eat less cheese, but there are things like you go to the supermarket and you say to the person at the cheese counter, would you mind wrapping mine in greaseproof paper, please? And they just go, yeah, all right. And, you know, we buy open vegetables from the market and we take them home in a basket. And actually, I have to say, it was a whole lot easier than any of us had ever imagined. So we stuck with it. 
So it's easy to think, oh, I can't do this. But actually, and we found things like I really, really missed potato crisps. I love potato crisps. And then I found a company that does them in bags that you just put straight in the household compost. Um, missed yogurt. And then the milkman started putting it on the doorstep in glass bottles. So I would say it sounded like I can't do this and I'll only do it for four weeks. But we were really surprised by how easy it was. It's interesting, isn't it? The the sort of the kind of like creativity that comes out of those things. You know, I think I think we've all probably all found that during lockdown. I don't know about in your households, but we've had some really interesting meal combinations. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think there's that whole idea of you know absolutely using everything, everything to the last. You know, I'm not. I mean, we're you know we we try to be as absolute kind of you know minimal. We recycle everything and we compost and we do all of those things here. But you know, it's never a, it's never a perfect system. But you always try to be better. But I think during this period of time where you've really had to question, you know, I actually don't want to go out from my home unless it's absolutely necessary to get, you know, some food that I need. Do we really need that? Could we manage with what we have? And so I think it's definitely been a time of creativity. There's something about that necessity is the mother of invention. And I absolutely agree with you. It ends up you discover all of these different um, other, you know, sustainable products that you didn't even realize were available. Um, excuse me, I'm going to sign off because I'm going to finish my cooking, okay? Shalom. Oh, shalom. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shalom, Yvonne. Lovely to shalom. meet you. Shalom. Thank you. And we've got, we've got a question or a comment from Eva, Eva Branston. Eva, you need to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi, can you hear me, everyone? <laughs> yes. Hi, 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 everyone. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful evening. Thanks so much for everything. And I, I just, something that came into my mind, the other day I was in the Zoom pub with my friends and uh, we were having a Zoom pub quiz, as you do. And uh, somebody was doing a round on chocolate and it was very exciting. And they showed on the shared screen uh, 20 photos of different kinds of chocolate bars or chocolate biscuits like Twix and uh, Milky Way, Lion Bar, all these, you know, things, but the photos only. And we had to write the names of, you know, and guess correctly, what are we looking at? Aero Bar, Flake, one of my favorites. And not at all for the first time. I just thought, because it was so interesting seeing all these different kinds of chocolate all there. We don't need 20 different kinds of chocolate bar. And there are more than that in Britain. And we just don't need them. And I was thinking about, I got thinking about rationing, uh, you know, during and after the Second World War, which is before I was born. And I just thought, I'd like to find out more about rationing. They didn't have 20 different kinds of chocolate bar in Anne Frank's time or after, how many did they have? What did they use to eat? How did they manage? Well, the answer is that they managed. They managed because they had no choice. They had to, and it was okay because it's not necessarily better to have 20, 30, 40 kinds of chocolate bar. We could do it too, and we would appreciate the planet more and be more mindful perhaps if we had less stuff including cheap primark crap which relies perhaps on abusive labor anyway so yeah it just made me think about the chocolate you know that's all thank you <laughs> it's it's interesting eve actually that you mentioned chocolate i'm quite a fan of, of vegan chocolate myself and Ooh. um one of the kind of discoveries that i had when i was on the generation share journey and if you haven't discovered this i'm absolutely sharing this uh, tonight for green shabbat is tony chocolonis does anybody heard of tony chocolonis no no so it's really incredible. So they're basically what they're doing is they're completely reimagining the whole you know, chocolate industry. Um, they're campaigners. They campaign for fair trade, for um, workers that work um, in cocoa and, you know, in chocolate to be fairly paid. And every single bar of chocolate is going to fund uh, that fair trade campaign and fund those workers um, wow. because the chocolate industry actually is incredibly exploitative. So when you actually look at, I mean, you mentioned various different brands that you mentioned and, you know, all of those 
are, you know, are incredibly, they're relying on ultimately on slave labor. And Tony Chocoloni's is a slave free brand. Um, and what I, one of the things that I love about it, apart from the fact that it's like really good chocolate and you can get it in so many different flavors and there are lots of vegan options which appeal to me. But also um, when you look at the bar of chocolate, it's not divided into equal chunks because yeah. their point is that the world currently is not, isn't, we live in a society that's not equal. Yeah. And what they say is that their chocolate bars will only become equally divided when there's parity in the world. And that's their big mission and their campaign. It's quite extraordinary. So, you know, check them out. Thank you so much for telling me about that. It's wonderful. I'm immediately going to share it on Facebook and only buy their chocolate from now on. Thank you so much. Okay, you, thanks. You said something very interesting before. You said about starting with me, because I'm one of the oldies. The most exercise I do at the moment is walking down the long corridor in Nottingham City Hospital. And uh, I hear other people of, of my age and they say, well, I can't complain or I can't do all of this and I can't change the, the, the world. But Hineni, we can say our prayers and we can do something, even if it's one person, just one thing, or giving a, it could be a chocolate bar to some poor person or whatever. So, and the other concern I have with some campaigners about lots of things, and I've been in lots of things, we don't want to make people do things. We don't want to be violent. And there are some people, you know, who want change. And I think we've got to do it in a lovely way. But I think what you said earlier, here am I, God, show me what I have to do. Does that make sense? And we can yeah, all do yeah. one little thing. And that's a start. That person you talk to might be a young person and they, they might know, change the world. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Boy. <laughs> yeah, hi. Hi, we're having Friday night dinner here and we never had so many people join us. <laughs> it's amazing. But uh, we live uh, just in Sherwood, actually about 100 yards from the shul. And, uh, and our next door neighbour set up this WhatsApp group. And there's about 50 houses in our street. 100. 100 houses. 100. And we're just sharing. It's amazing. I've got a bag of sharp sand. I'm down, which has been had for about five years. And somebody said, oh, they want some sharp sand to lay a patio. And so I gave it them. People have been leaving old bits of tables and furniture they want to get rid of, and other people have been picking up on the end of the street. The and drive. toys and books have been exchanged, and yeah. we're shopping for each other. Every time we go out to the shops, we say we're going to whatever, and uh, and people say, oh, can you get this? Can you get this? So it, it's, it's always been a reasonably friendly street, but we've never known each other like, like we have during the pandemic. And it's also it's been WhatsApp. amazing. It's that's it. Thank you very much, Jeff. Has anyone got a question or a comment to make? Has anyone got a question to ask Benita? Benita, while people are making up their minds, I've got a question to ask. Well, if everyone understands and as excited about sharing, why we're still not there? Well, you know, it, I think these things take time. And I mean, I, I'm really positive about the fact that, you know, we've, we've seen a big shift. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that this pandemic has demonstrate, demonstrated just what's possible. You know, for years, people would say, well, that's not possible. I can't possibly do that. You know, that's, I mean, I, I, you know, I just think, you know, you, you know, you talk to so many different organizations who've just had to make these changes. And, you know, when in, in the face of, you know, given this face of this pandemic, we've had to make these lifestyle choices. And it demonstrates that we can change, we can do this. The question now and the challenge now is about building back better. It's to make sure that we don't revert to business as usual. Um, but I believe that one of the things, and this is, you know, this is really kind of my, my mission, is all about demonstrating that it's possible by making these positive stories visible. And, you know, I think when we start to see that, you know, people the world over are, you know, there are so many examples. I mean, I've seen, I've been collecting stories. I started a blog at the beginning of the pandemic called Love in the Time of Corona. And I started collecting positive stories of people that were taking 
social action all over the world. And you know, for every country in the world, there were so many positive stories. And I got to the point where you know there was there were too many to publish, actually, which is a lovely problem to have. But the reality is that you know, generally speaking, in terms of mainstream media, and I worked in broadcasting for over 20 years, and I worked as a journalist for, for years and years for the BBC and for other broadcasters, and I know how difficult it is, that's the reason why I left, I know how difficult it is to make these positive stories visible, and I think that's one of the things that we need to work so hard to make these positive stories visible. So I believe that it's there, it's just that we don't hear about it. So, you know, I always kind of refute this idea that, you know, things are getting worse and worse. Actually, when you start to really look at the evidence base, you know, in terms of poverty, for example, and, and what the work that we've done to tackle poverty to increase equality, you know, over the last decade, it's really tremendous. But what we need to be doing is we need to elevate the status of these positive stories. And that's what we need to focus on. Those are the stories that we need to give visibility because very often, we don't we talk about the negative stuff and certainly you know you you look at the news and you know you really see a lot of negativity so i think all of us can tell positive stories you know we can all share the things that we hear about that are you know where positive people are doing all kinds of transformational work in their communities and also i think you know we need to be proud of the things that we the actions that we take on a daily basis yes. you know um, I mean, Jeffrey, you, you spoke about the, the, you know, in your in your street, how, you know, these WhatsApp groups and, you know, these mutual aid, COVID mutual aid, mutual aid um, projects have, have, you know, sprouted up all over the country in, in my street here in Brighton. Um, you know, every day during during the, the sort of height of the pandemic, you know, people have been helping each other, you know, a disabled couple that live across the street and every day someone else was getting their shopping, you know, cooking, dropping things on their doorstep, getting their prescriptions, anybody needed help at any point in time, it was absolutely there and offered and you know, you just think about the fact that within a, a 48 hour period, 750,000 people volunteered for the end to help the NHS. So, I, you know, I believe there's so much goodwill there, but we need to shine a light on it. We need to show that it's there because otherwise, you know, you would think that, you know, there is, there's so much negativity around. Mm. Thank you um, so much, Manita. It's, it's, it's great to hear about, about it. Thank you very much. We've got Sharon. Sharon wants to say something or ask a question and then, Ray, then Ray please uh, Ray Sylvester. Hi thanks Rabbi Tanya. Actually I just want to share it's not on my street because unfortunately we although in our own little housing community we probably know each other a, a lot better than we did but um, a good friend of mine who lives locally she's there's quite a few children in her cul-de-sac and um for varying different reasons they had stuff where they've had to shield quite um, substantially so they did two really beautiful things one they have built a fish pond with all the children to teach them about like um, the lakes and nature and animal kingdom and the other was where there were two particularly really vulnerable children they actually cut off the street for a certain point of the day just so these kids could run around and everyone stayed inside so that they wouldn't, couldn't be affected. So I just thought that was really beautiful. I thought I'd share. So I love that Sharon. story. Yeah. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that, Sharon. And can I just intervene saying that Ray raised next and then and then I can see that Jacob Foreman has raised his hand. So Jacob, you, you go, you will go after Ray. All right. Shabbat shalom. A glass of mellow there. Um, Anita, I, I, I'm really fascinated by what you've been saying and the caring, sharing society. And on a micro level, uh, yeah, wonderful things have been happening during the pandemic. Um, uh, but let me ask you, I'll tell you about two people, two young people that I know. And I want to ask you, what is their future? What should I say to them when I see them? Across the, behind my computer here, behind the wall is our next door neighbor. And our next door neighbor's son, Matt, is an airline pilot for British Airways. And at the moment, he has no future. He and his family have spent, I don't know how many, thousands upon thousands of pounds getting him trained. And at the moment, he doesn't know whether he's got a job, whether he'll ever fly again, because, of course, 
the effect of the pandemic on the worldwide uh, air, airline industry. We have a very good friend, a, a young woman uh, who, who's brought her son up, Sam, and he has he lived in Derby. And the only thing that Sam ever, ever, ever wanted to do was work for Rolls Royce in Derby and join his uncle, also worked in Rolls Royce. Sam finished his apprenticeship in January. He is now out of work because Rolls Royce have laid off many thousands upon thousands of people and, at the, and does not appear to have a future. Now, on a human level, Vanita, what do I say to Sam? What do I say to Matt in this world which is changing in such horrendous ways? I think that, you know, it's a it's a really challenging time for young people. It's a challenging time for many people. But, you know, particularly, you know, I have two teenagers here in the house, my daughter, who's, you know, an A-level student and my son, who next year will be taking his GCSEs. And, you know, these conversations are, you know, we've been having them frequently. Um, and and I do think it's a, you know, hugely challenging time for young people. I think it's, you know, there's there's a huge shift happening. You know, we've, you know, everybody, you know, the, the unprecedented word is, is mentioned however many times a day. And, you know, it's, we've, you know, we've never, we've never had this, this kind of crisis before that's affected us, you know, affected the world in, you know, in this kind of way. And it is, hugely challenging and I'm not suggesting that you know there are any kind of instant solutions because I don't believe that's you know I just don't believe that's practical and that's realistic what I do say to my son and daughter and what I do say to you know other young people that you know that I talk to and that I'm involved in through my charity is that you know it, it really is about you know looking at um how we can make a positive contribution to the world through the work that we do. And I believe that, you know, there are some industries that are just not going to survive this. And, and that's a reality. And it's a really harsh reality. And particularly, as you say, if you've been training in a particular field, that is a really difficult thing. It's hugely challenging. But the fact is that the world is changing. And, you know, we have choices. Um, you know, Desmond Tutu talks about this idea that, you know, a time of crisis is an opportunity to choose well or to choose badly. And and I, I believe that that's, you know, that's absolutely true that, you know, we are having to make different kinds of choices. We're being put in a position that we never imagined that we were going to be in this situation. And it just isn't easy. So I don't believe there are any easy answers. But I think that, you know, when we start to look at and we hear these terms, you know, key workers, we start to get an idea. And I know Janet Bray had posted earlier on the chat to me this idea that, you know, we're, we're moving into a time where it's about what's necessary and what's vital and whatever it isn't necessary really will not survive. And I believe that to be true. So obviously there are going to be lots of casualties. This is, you know, we're in a pandemic. We're also in a climate crisis and we have to change our ways. You know, we could not, the planet could not sustain the amount of flying that, you know, that was occurring, the, you know, the levels of, you know, of carbon. We're here on, on Green Shabbat to talk about these issues. And the reality is that there is already pain. You know, I was reading a post earlier today by, you know, Greta Thunberg, and she was talking about, you know, the rise in temperatures in certain parts of the world at the moment. And she's saying, when are people going to wake up to this? And that's the reality. So there may well be, you know, careers that we had imagined for ourselves that young people have trained in. But the reality is, is that some of these are just simply not going to survive. So I think we have to inspire our young people and focus them towards those industries and those areas that are going to help the planet because ultimately it's the businesses and the industries that are going to be about survival, that are going to be sustainable, that will survive. And I think that's what we're going to have to do. But is there going to be pain? Absolutely. You know, this is this is not this is a difficult situation. We are absolutely facing so many crises in this world. But I believe as human beings, you know, and as Jewish communities, we have a huge opportunity to have a positive impact. And I think that's what we need to be focusing on. What I actually said to Sam was that uh, there may or may not be a future for you in the aero industry. But there is a future for you because you're a bright lad, you're quick on your feet, you think quick, you're very creative, you're entrepreneurial, and therefore you will do well. 
But those people who are not all those things that I've just described Sam as being, they're in Stuch, big time Stuch, I think, because the world of the, the immediate world, the short term, the, 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 the medium and the long term world that we're, we're going into doesn't exist anymore. And the quicker these young people realize that, it's okay if old gets like me, the quicker they realize this, the, the happier they're going to be. And I've said the same thing to my, my granddaughter, who is just finishing university, is, well, not this year, next year, that she's going to have to be quick on her feet and look for opportunities that perhaps would have come to her automatically before. And I've said the same thing to my other granddaughter in Scotland, um, a very able young, young woman who, whose future appeared to be mapped out. And now she's going to have to rethink her future. And the people who succeed in the future are the people who can think on their feet and, and openly. I mean, I don't know whether you have a comment on that, Benita. By the way, I've never met you, Benita. I didn't know until a few minutes ago that you existed. But here we are. Can I just, can I just answer very quickly? Benita will, will, I'm sure, has got an opinion, Ray. And she will tell you. But we also have got a few more people who want to say something or ask. So just want to remind you, we've got another five minutes with Benita, and then we will move to the next part of our evening of our Onyx Shabbat. It will be Rebbe Andrew Goldstein and Louise Lipman from Nottingham from the Hockerton Housing Project, Eco Village, uh, a unique project in our country. So please ask your questions very quickly. If you've got to make a point, just be considerate of other people wanted to speak. Now we, we, we're going on after Benita's comments, we'll go on to Jacob, and then after our high tech guru, Leo Mindel, and then I can see Sharon put her hand up as well. Thank you. That's all right, no, it's, whoops, uh, just mute myself. Hiya, um, so a question for uh, Benita, my name's Jacob, I'm from East London and Essex as liberal synagogue and at work I actually run a food bank and um, cook, kitchen for cooking for people that are vulnerable at the moment um, and stuck indoors and there's something that's really really bothering me and it um, after hearing you talk about food waste and how much we actually waste in this society is used by dates because I get so much food in that has got to go out kind of immediately because of a use by date and as soon as it's past that date I'm not allowed to give it out anymore even though everyone can tell that that food is fine to use and I just think it really contributes to a lot of waste so I was wondering if there's any movements to try and uh, that you're aware of that try and make use by dates somewhat more realistic to cut down on how much food we actually waste as a society. Well, the people that I know that are doing some incredible work in this area are Fair Share. And for those of you who haven't come across Fair Share, they're an extraordinary charity in the UK. And what they do is they divert food that would needlessly go to landfill to people living in food poverty. Last year, they um, they fed, uh, they supplied 53.5 million meals to people across the UK living in food poverty from food that would have been needlessly um, sent to landfill. And, and they do a lot of work around sell by dates. And you're absolutely right that these dates are wildly inaccurate. Um, you know, they're based on all sorts of commercial priorities. And, and actually, they don't have a relation to actually the, the, the use of that resource and the real kind of lifespan of that resource. And it's incredibly frustrating. So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, some of the incredible work that's being done is being done by fair share. Um, in, in that arena, they work, they do a lot of work to influence policy um, and to influence businesses. They have a lot of partnerships right across the, the food industry. Um, the other organization that are really interesting, a really interesting social business here in Brighton is a, a rebel supermarket called How It Should Be. And Ruth and Amy Anslow set up an extraordinary supermarket um, and it's called His Be How It Should Be. And they started with a completely blank canvas and they said, OK, well, what does a fair uh, supermarket look like that actually supports the local economy, um, that is supporting local suppliers? And it was astounding to me. I interviewed them for the Generation Share book and ordinarily in, in a typical supermarket, um, only nine pence um, of every pound of every pound that you spend goes to the suppliers of the you know goes to the suppliers 
whereas in at his beat it's 68 pence and that just gives you an idea that when you start from this position of fairness and when you start to plow money back into the local economy and pay, pay people in a fair way they've created an incredibly sustainable business so it is possible and they're also doing some work around sell by dates so all of these things are possible and i believe we just we need to challenge them because they're, you're right, they're, they're, not, they're not right and they don't make any sense. And it's only by challenging these really outdated um, laws and policies that we're, we're going to create any change in the world. This is fascinating, Benita. Thank you very much. Leo is next and then Sharon and then Janet. And probably we'll have to close after that. It's clearly been so exciting. Thank you very much. So again, next is Leo, then is uh, Sharon and then Janet. Anita, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, really, really interesting on the points that you've mentioned. Um, just pivoting it slightly onto transport. There's somebody mentioned about the transport and the fact that planes are not there. Uh, I believe as of this weekend, we are finally, finally in this country allowed to have uh, electric scooters. Um, as a big user of uh, electric bikes and electric scooters everywhere in the rest of the world, it's taken a pandemic for this country to change, to use things that everybody else is realizing is a much, much more efficient way than getting in a taxi. Do you see other things like this being able to, that we're gonna break these uh, issues of outdated modes um, and use this as an opportunity? I really hope so, you know, and I think, I mean, I'm, I feel very fortunate to live in Brighton because, you know, there are, of course, so many interesting innovations that, that we see that are trialled here. You know, we have one of the most successful bike sharing schemes, for example, in the whole of Europe in Brighton. And, you know, and, and there are quite a number of, um, of different transport modes, shared transport modes that have been piloted here. Um, and I, I, you know, I think there's so much more that we could do. One of the things that I do see, and that is, is very, very clear though, is that, you know, all of the car manufacturers absolutely understand that, you know, they are, are having to find, you know, new ways of being more sustainable. And these shared transport options and opportunities are being explored um, by, you know, the biggest corporates, you know, that are working in this area of transport. So I think we're seeing more and more of that. One of the challenges, of course, during this pandemic and just having spoken as I often do to many of the car sharing companies and the lift sharing, ride sharing platforms in the UK. Um, of course, there's been lots of issues around, you know, social distancing and the inability to share. And I think that, you know, parts of the sharing economy have been really challenged during this time. Um, and those com responsible companies have been finding all kinds of ways to share safely. Um, we've been part of a, of a car sharing scheme here in Brighton and, you know, they have to sanitise, of course, the cars in between each use. Um, and there's a 48 hour period either side where the cars can't be used. And so I think, you know, again, we're seeing, you know, all kinds of ways in which um, these, you know, these sustainable shared transport options are becoming more and more sustainable, but it has been a huge challenge. And of course, you know, public transport, I mean, there's a form of, you know, of, of transport sharing, and that's been hugely challenged. So I think it has been a difficult time. I believe that we're going to find all kinds of ways in which we're going to make this safe again, because we, we need to. Well, thank you so much, Benita. It's fascinating. Now I know who to talk to about organizing a cycling campaign of providing all the cycling lanes around the country. I'm going to do a national one. Benita, you're, you're my person. Just a few comments before we'll, we'll go to Sharon and then to Janet. Uh, Richard, Rabbi Richard uh, Jacobi is saying that locally here and elsewhere, the Felix project does good work in this field at the comment. And John Morris uh, says that race comments are so real that a generation ago, all 16 year olds speak and choose their apprenticeship job normally very local with minimal traveling times have changed. People now travel and are more highly qualified and we're witnessing a complex change. If you have the right attitude, are flexible and willing to learn, then opportunities will come your way, but they may not be on your doorstep. So the point is changes to look for opportunities. Thank you very much everyone for contributing and now is the question from Sharon and then Janet. Sorry, it was on, on mute there. Um was it's just to, to share early um what was said earlier because I'm not sure you saw it in the comments. Um 
I, I actually am one of the key workers. I'm a higher level teaching assistant and I work with young people with SEN needs um, and social, emotional, mental health. Um, so there's a lot of obvious challenges <laughs> there, which it, it, it's, it's difficult. And the scooters, you know, they're lovely and things like that. It's, it's okay. But for some young people, that's a really difficult thing. And is there a way that you can see cars could be made sustainable that 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 were for families and, and things were of people that really do need it for anxiety and mental health issues well actually i had um i had a really interesting call last week um uh with someone who works in kent and he set up something called the community driving school and what they do is they work with specifically with young people with special needs and, and this is all about um, empowering. It's about empowering people. It's about, yes, teaching them the skill of driving, but it's it's also very much about being part of a community. So it's, a, it's like a shared driving hub. So you're learning um, with other people. Obviously, they've had all kinds of challenges during, during COVID-19, but there's really a principle there about giving um, young people with special needs an opportunity. And, and what they've been focusing on during this time is that skill in terms of, you know, becoming a key worker, for example, you know, food delivery and so on. And so, you know, that particular social enterprise is really focusing on exactly what you're talking about, because it's about, you know, giving people, it's empowering, it's about mobility, um, it's about a new skill, it's about employment opportunities. And I think very often we do find in the social enterprise sector, that these extraordinary innovative businesses really are looking at these pressing social problems and finding ways to enable and encourage and provide opportunities for, for you know, for people from all kinds of, of challenges and different backgrounds. And, you know, that's just one example that, that comes to mind, Sharon, when you when you mentioned the, you know, special educational needs. Thank you so much, Benita. And now it's Janet. And while Janet is unmuting herself very quickly, because we actually are running now late, I would like to read a comment from Hava Fleming, who says, UK progressive synagogues rock. So much support and sharing. We are far behind you in Europe. Definitely, Benita definitely rocks. And everyone, <laughs> as well. that's fantastic. Janet, Thank please. You. Hi, um, my name's Connie. I'm Janet's daughter. And I'd like to share that I'm a disabled young woman from Brighton. And I know what it feels like because I'm a, I'm a waitress at the moment and it, I don't know how, how the job's going to go because it's harder, well, it's hard for disabled people to get jobs like what I've got. So I don't, so the future's unpredictable and also my mother here is a critical care nurse for children. So I feel that, well, support workers are really like great at the moment because they actually help, they're helping with this, like with COVID-19, but, um, and hopefully, they keep working like this that means everyone will maybe get their jobs back and be able to rebuild their lives absolutely i mean it's it it has been a really challenging time and you know i i i i think it's about you know, support and tapping into that, you know, support within your community. Have you, have you been able to, you know, we've talked about these different mutual aid groups and have you been able to tap into support in your community? Cause I think that's, I think that's so important. You know, we, we, we need to find those, those avenues, those other people that we can connect with in community, because you're absolutely right that, you know, there are so many challenges and, you know, you're, you mentioned working as a waitress and, what you know the future of that you know we know that restaurants or some restaurants and, and pubs and so on are opening up 
this weekend but you know lots of challenges around you know how that's going to go and and it is it is all quite uncertain isn't it so huge challenges but you know I hope that you're able to tap into that local support you know in your community. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the questions and thank you so much, Benita. It was a fantastic discussion time. And please read, read Benita's book, Generation Share, and read her blog, A Blog of Positivity. And uh, thank you so much, Benita. We, we loved having you with us. Uh, thank you for thank you so much and just one thing to one thing to let you know about the book is that every copy that's sold it's a non-profit um venture but every um book that's sold actually feeds and educates a girl in the slums in mumbai and plants a tree and it's the book itself is made from 100 percent waste materials so it's you know it's all about sharing in and of itself in the way that it's delivered there's also an e-version as well if you don't want a physical book that's fantastic. Let's share. Let's share, everyone. Thank you so much, Benita, for a wonderful time. And, and now I would like to welcome the president of Liberal Judaism, Rabbi Andrew Goldstein, and Louise Lipman, who is the member of Nottingham Liberal Synagogue and has been living in the Hockettson housing project for the last mm -hmm. 18 years, for the last 18 years with her family together. And Rabbi Andrew Goldstein does not need introduction only because we are streaming. I'll say that he's the founder of uh, Northwood and Pina Liberal Synagogue, big, big, big congregation. And he is the founder of, of uh, LJY Netza, certainly the father of it. Uh, all the Madrihim remember him very fondly. And he is a very passionate um, advocate for development of progressive Judaism in Europe and certainly promoting the Czech scroll Shabbat and connections uh, in Czech Republic. And he's just a wonderful rabbi and a wonderful person. Whenever he comes to Nottingham, it's like a special celebration for us. So I would like to welcome Rabbi Andrew Goldstein and a wonderful person, Louise Lipman, who is a friend and a member of our community and a very much an eco living person who doesn't talk about sustainability she lives sustainably and she'll tell you all about it herself let's welcome them into our evening thank you everybody um i'm not sure i recognized all that you were saying about me but um and i have to say i wasn't i'm still not sure exactly what i'm meant to be saying now um i but i think first of all congratulations on an incredible service we had earlier um, both the, the readings and the poetry um, and the, the way you put together the liturgy it was very moving. Uh, and in a way, a lot of why what I'm going to say is perhaps um, was covered by the service. Um, but I suppose the, almost the best thing about it was to get eight congregations together and to see all those faces on the screen. Um, I apologize if I had popped out now and again because um, Next door, uh, my wife is watching another service, and that is from Finchley Progressive Synagogue, where they have their Kabbalah Torah tonight. So this is just sort of uh, incredible how many services are going around the liberal Jewish movement at this on this very Shabbat and how lucky we are to have it. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not sure um, about exactly what the subject I was meant to talk about, which is it never stops a rabbi from talking, so we'll see how we go. Um, but when I, I thought about sort of Judaism and um, in the environment and ecological concerns, I went to a couple of books I've had on my shelves for a long time. It says, what does Judaism say about it? One was from the late 70s and another was from the 80s. And I found that um, neither of them had any answers. None of them covered the questions of ecology or environment. Um, and so um, it's just, uh, it just shows how we've entered a completely new era in the last couple of decades. Um, what does Judaism say about the environment and ecology? Well, I suppose that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and I'm going to go back to the beginning where it all began. Um, I'm sure I needn't tell you this one, Genesis uh, chapter one. Um, the vegetation and the trees were trees of every kind with their fruit in them was created um, on day three, the animal kingdom on day five and six, uh, with humankind a late afterthought, uh, arriving at the end of the sixth day. 
In the second account of creation, chapter two of Genesis, it mentions uh, grasses and shrubs only appearing late because it says no rain had been sent on earth and there was no one to till the soil. And so it seems as though right from the beginning, gardeners get an essential mention. And I don't know about you, but it has already been said earlier in the service that my garden has been the best ever. Um, for the first time, I've had time to tend it. And I love that um, sentence, which Fiona Halbert used right at the beginning of the service, um, closer to God in a, in a garden than anywhere else. And that's certainly true, although sometimes we see the other side of God's nature when, uh, when the black fly gets all of your beans and, uh, uh, and the rot sets in, but uh, I know what she means. Adam and Eve were created to live in that garden and it didn't need gardeners because it was paradise and so an easy life. And no sooner than having been given the gift of living in the perfect world, of course, the first humans louse it up, doing what they were told not to do, eating of the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge, the essential next step in human development. For once we have knowledge, you can't go back on it. You can't go back to a stage before, back to paradise, as Adam and Eve found. It's the challenge we have had ever since, well, especially challenging since the Industrial Revolution, with all sorts of advancements, but impossible to reverse, impossible to return to the Garden of Eden. And the genius who uh, composed the book of Genesis goes on to picture the world after the expulsion. It says thorns and thistles sprouting from the earth. Weeds were created, hard toil to find your food ever after. And human heartache then comes with the first children. Never easy being parents, but we hope never fratricide. But then generation three, and along comes Tubal Cain, and it says, who forged all implements of copper and iron. The first industrial revolution began way back in Genesis chapter four. Though we should remember that his cousin was Jubal, who was the ancestor, it says, of all who play the lyre and the pipe. So whenever we despair of the negative effects that industrialization can bring to our world, let us also gain comfort from the thought that music was also created at the same time. The harmful, and the beauty go hand in hand. And think of it, if Eve had not grasped the fruit of knowledge, human existence might have stayed in the garden, but never moved on. Human history would have ossified and we would be like robots in a make-believe fairy tale world. And so human history did carry on I suppose, in a way, until we discovered Tikkun Olam, the slogan of the 1970s, the new religious imperative that inspired the concept of this very Shabbat, the green Shabbat. The, though the, the need to preserve nature and the world of beauty and plenty that God has created has been a Jewish imperative all along, indeed founded in the very book of Genesis, which began it all. Forgive me if I mention it on Green Shabbat, but the registration number on my car is Kitov. The very words God spoke when viewing each day's work of creation. It was good. And after creating humankind, it says it was Tov Ma'od, it was very good. We have to remember always that creation is good and that life should be very good on it. But then Genesis continues, let us make humans in our image and after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the cattle and the whole earth. But what does it mean to rule? Or as some translations have it, to have, to, to have dominion over it. Chapter two says, Adam was placed in the garden to till and to care for it. We have to actively look after the creative world not just take from it and dominate upset some 
But Abraham Ibn Ezra wrote in the 12th century, based on Psalm 115, where it says, the heavens are the heavens of the eternal one, but the earth has he given to humankind. Ibn Ezra says, this means that we are like God's stewards, charged to exercise responsibility in God's name for all that exists. And so the concept of tikkun olam goes back to Genesis, but certainly back throughout Jewish tradition. And what does it mean to be a pakid? As Ibn Ezra said, we are stewards. We are stewards of, of God's creation. And I came across a lovely passage about the saintly Rav Cook, the first chief rabbi of what was to become Israel. And in this story, a visitor recalled that in, 19, in, in 1904, I went to pay my respects to the chief rabbi in Jaffa. He received me warmly and after afternoon prayers, took me out into the fields as was his wont. As we were walking, I plucked a flower and he trembled and told me quietly that he always took great care not to pluck anything growing unless it was for some benefit. For every plant below has its guardian above. And by the way, I think Rav Cook was maybe the first vegetarian in Israel. So we must look after nature. And I'm sure you've heard the verses in Deuteronomy chapter 20. When you are at war and they siege to a city, do not destroy its trees by taking an ax to them, for they provide you with food. You could say it was merely being prudent because after conquering the city, you would want the fruit trees for your own benefit. But Jewish tradition used this verse, which of course it believed was God's very word, to derive all sorts of ecological imperatives that predate by centuries modern ecological concerns. The verse came in rabbinic tradition, the locus classicus for conserving all that was created by God and, and by human beings. The concept was Val Tashchit, do not destroy. And it said that if in the emergency of wartime such acts are forbidden, then all the more so at times of peace and ease. And the laws and instructions coming under his regime become wide and impressive. The Torah verses say, you shall not chop down a tree using an ax. But this was extended by the rabbis to mean any destructive uh, method. For instance, it says, we are forbidden to divert a river or a stream if it meant depriving one area of trees and crops of their natural environment and stunting their growth or their productivity. Maimonides included the following as mandated by Baal Tashchit. And I quote, he said, not only one who cuts down fruit trees, but anyone who destroys household goods, tears clothing, demolishes a building, stops up a spring, or ruins food deliberately, violates the prohibition of Baal Tashchit. What a comment on our modern throwaway fast food society that is. And a rabbinic note condemns those who burn a naphtha lamp too strongly because they say they're using a precious commodity. Remember that one as you switch off the lights when you leave a room. Another Talmudic statement condemns those who, it says, can get along on barley, but insist on eating wheat. Evidently, barley was, uh, wheat was much more expensive than, uh, than, than, than barley. It, but then it continued, or those who are happy drinking mead, but went on to drink fine wine, they were guilty of bal tashchi. Of course, this is where it gets contentious. Where does one strike a balance? Why not try something more adventurous? Why not invent something? Why not have a fresh diet? Why not try something? But what if one is never satisfied and forever wants something extra, something more exotic? You can apply it to food with our importation of delicious fruits from Chile or from Thailand or out of season apples from New Zealand, you know the score. What about the land itself? 
I need only mention the laws of the sabbatical year where the land was to lie fallow for every seventh year to rejuvenate itself, just as a human being should rest on the seventh day. By the time of the Mishnah, there are discussions about what one can do with the land. Of course, the land here being the land of Israel, but others apply it to the, law, the laws more widely. For instance, there's a discussion in the Talmud on whether one can let goats or sheep roam freely because they eat the bark and foliage of trees and kill them and so despoil the land. And this we know did happen after the destruction of the temple. And the Jewish population decreased. Nomadic shepherds did despoil the land. And only in modern times did the Zionist endeavor show how to restore the land to its natural productiveness and doing it by going back to creation and planting trees. And of course, planting trees was one of the mitzvot that we have in the Torah. And also going back to the Torah, the, the remark that, uh, that the ancient harvest festivals of Pesach, Shavuot and Sukkot were a celebration of the beauty and product of the natural land, that we need to celebrate nature in our worship of the Creator, just as we did tonight in the service. It's not just preserving it, but rejoicing in its beauty and bounty. It always intrigues me that, I don't know if you know what was the most celebrated festival by the secular anti-religious pioneers on the Kibbutzim from the early 20th century. You might say Tu Bishvat or something like that, but evidently no, it was Shavuot. The religious, the one that religious Jews celebrate for giving of the Torah, but for non-religious farmers, it was a celebration of nature. They knew how to appreciate and celebrate the work of their hands and backs. It was back to the beginnings of our people and back to the earliest time. I suspect that most, if not all, orthodox yeshivot do not spend too much time on the halakha, the, the, the halachot, the laws of environmental concerns. But I can think of a few rabbinic statements that they should add to their curriculum. For instance, it, it, it's just amazing when you start to go into it. Because Deuteronomy 23, um, where it says that you must establish toilets, to use a modern term, outside the camp boundaries. And from this instruction, this biblical verse, the Talmud describes the need to remove all refuge to safe places outside the town. Indeed, the Talmud forbids the development even of kitchen gardens or even orchards around Jerusalem on the grounds that putting manure on the plants would despoil the nature of the environment around the holy city. I mean, it's just amazing how they were discussing things about the despoilation of the land. Imagine how a modern halachist could develop this one to deal with the siting of spoil heaps from modern mining and industry or the disposal of mountains of domestic waste today. And the risk to living conditions from noxious smells, from cesspits and from tanneries is discussed in the Talmud and it's codified in the Shulchan Aruch. The Mishnah bans the siting of a, a threshing floor within 50 cubits of a residential area. It says since the flying particles set in motion by the threshing process would diminish the quality of the air. The second century Rabbi Nathan ruled that furnaces must not be sited within 50 cubits from houses because of the effects of the smoke on the atmosphere. Those were his very words. I could quote Halachot seeking to safeguard the purity of waters uh, and one's on the right to for every individual to have clean water. And Rashi discusses the right to ban a shop if the noise it might produce would disturb the tra tranquility of the neighborhood. But it allows a school to open because the education of children are a priority. Clearly it's a matter of the greater good and reaching an acceptable compromise. And that is the factor I'll return to in a moment. Sufficient to say 
that if one is looking for ancient precedent in Jewish teaching, for many of the environmental concerns we have in our own time, texts are there to be found. And they must say that searching from them made me proud of my rabbinic tradition. Would that it had been studied, it is studied more closely and applied more vigorously. It's often been remarked that Jews are not really into the beauty of nature or the environment, or were not so, maybe it's changed. Jews, it's said, are not great gardeners or botanists. I suppose it's understandable for the Jews of past generations living in hovels in the shtetl, toiling to make a living fearful of rampaging pogroms. Just think of the tenements in the East End of London or other cities, there were no places, there was no place or time for a flower garden or a lawn. But in fact, Jewish tradition does urge us to admire and preserve the beauty of nature. Just think back to the, the description of the promised land of Israel in the Torah, a land of brooks of water springing forth from the hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines and fig trees and pomegranates, oil tr olive trees and date palms. And the beauty was there to be admired. Rabbi Yehuda said, a person who goes out in the month of Nisan, that's the spring, and sees trees coming to leaf says, blessed be the one who made the world so it lacks nothing and created good creatures and good trees for our pleasure. Another version, shorter and easy to remember. Remember this one. It's, it says in, in Barachot, one who sees goodly creatures and beautiful plants says, Baruch Atta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shekacha Lob Olamo. Blessed be the God who created such as these in the world. Can there be any doubt that we are urged to appreciate the beauty of nature and to say a blessing whenever moved by it? I've approached the subject through a Jewish attitude to nature and ecology. Though fake focusing mainly on the plant kingdom, I suppose I could have also developed Jewish attitude to animals and how this impacts on the environment and on our diet and on the future of the world. But Dayenu, enough for tonight. Just one quote because it amuses me. Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Rav, Everything the Eternal One created has a purpose. Even things that humans may consider to be unnecessary, such as flies, fleas, and mosquitoes, are, for they are part of creation. I suspect that only James would fully appreciate this one, but maybe it serves to make us think about the way we view all of nature, the roses and the thorns, the dahlias and the weeds. Long ago, in fact, I did a degree in botany and zoology. Though I got into it by mistake and, it, and I didn't use it in my career because instead of becoming a scientist, I became a rabbi. One of my historical heroes is Moses Maimonides, who managed to combine both disciplines of botany, zoology, and many, many more one of his key principles was of balance and the avoidance of extremes, the so-called golden mean. It was, it was said that he was influenced by Aristotle on this one. It's a sensible approach. Let me give you one example. The Torah says it is forbidden to chop down a fruit tree. But what if it is no longer productive, asks Maimonides. The comment says, yes, you can chop it down, but only if you plant another to replace it. Good sense and proportionate and constructive thinking. In so many aspects of human life, it is striking the right balance that is sensible. And this applies to us as individuals and societies, whether it be in our industry, in our agriculture, in our personal diets, in our lifestyle. This COVID lockdown has taught us many things. The tragedies, the inconveniences, the cost to so many. 
but also, as I think been said already a number of times tonight, the blessings of the empty roads, the clear blue sky by day and the renewed appreciation of the stars by night, and the real sounds of the singing birds, the beauty of God's creation. If only we could learn to restore more permanently the balance of nature we have enjoyed these past months. But let me end with that wonderful meditation attributed to Rabbi Nachman of Bratzlaw. He said, Ribono Shelolem, master of the universe, grant me the ability to be alone. May it be accustomed to go outdoors each day among the trees and grass, among all growing things. And there may we be alone and enter into prayer. There may we express all that is in our hearts, talking with the one to whom we belong. And may the grasses, trees and plants awaken to our coming, send the power of their life into our words of prayer, making whole our hearts and our speech. To that I say, Amen. Amen indeed. Thank you so much, Reverend Andrew. That was beautiful. And I think it strengthened to all of us the connection of Judaism and now Jerusalem to the world around us is so clear now, and particularly that moment of appreciation at saying blessings for every new things which we see around and all the beauty of the world around okay. us. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think, I think now no one will have doubt that our connection with the world around us is very Jewish in essence, that's, and that's our responsibility as well. Thank you again. And now I would like to invite on this positive note and a very inspirational note, uh, Louise Lipman, to share her story with us. Okay. And her videos as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, thank you. And uh, yeah, wow, what a, what, what, um, what a group of people really, uh, tonight and last night and hearing all the things that uh, people have said. And I'm thinking, well, actually, you know, we, it, it has all been said. I mean, it's, it's all in there. And I think, as Tanya said, it's, you know, I think as Jews, it's subliminal, isn't it? When we, from when we were little going to shul uh, a lot more regularly than I do now, because, it, you know, I got taken along and, you know, reading the prayers day after day, week after week, year after year, it just, just goes in, doesn't it? That appreciation of nature and that ability to observe the beauty of nature. Um, and uh, I think that probably explains why, you know, Green Shabbat is happening and there's all these uh, amazing people co connected here. Um, and I think what uh, Benita was saying about change and change being poss po possible. And, and then Bill, I think, su summed it up really. He said, we can all change, uh, but we don't want to make people do things. Uh, people just, we, we all need to do what we can do. And um, I think Benita said, be proud of what we can do, um, but don't be guilty about what we can't do. You know, we, uh, last night, in fact, on the, um, on, on, on the Green uh, Eco Synagogues, um, I think it was Tamara who uh, works for DEFRA, and she was saying how change is hard. Well, I think if you work for DEFRA, you know, it's like trying to turn a tanker. It probably is really hard. You know, but we're little, like little sailing ships. Each of us is like a little sailing ship. And uh, well, they're a lot easier, a lot easier to turn. And uh, so I suppose that's what I want to talk about today is how we can each uh, turn our sailing ship. Um, the other thing last night, I suppose, which struck me and, and again tonight, you know, there's a lot of rabbis. So there's a lot of talk about faith. And I think uh, for me here, faith translates into passion and our heart's desire. Uh, and uh, Rabbi Mark Goldsmith said last night, what we have learned from the COVID pandemic is that if we perceive the threat is serious enough, the world will make changes very quickly. So even those tankers, if they, you know, if they wanted to, they can change them, they can turn them. Um, uh, and then uh, Esben Larson uh, last night invited us to be with ourselves in nature. Uh, I think here we may be inspired and I, I I really wonder if that's why there's been so much sort of inspiration, so much call to change things, 
while we've been in the COVID lockdown, because I just wonder if more people have had a moment, not everyone, some people have been working harder than ever during this, but uh, maybe the lockdown has given more people a chance to observe a little bit of nature. Uh, even those, those people who couldn't see blue skies before because of the pollution, those people who lived near the Himalayas but could never see them, etc. You know, that, that, those, and nature, I think, gives us the inspiration. And I, I, well, maybe I've got some theories about that happens. I do a lot of Qigong, Tai Chi, and, uh, you know, the way we connect with nature. But I, I don't think this is a coincidence um, in that connection. We are all natural beings. We are created from the earth. And if you think about it, you know, we are made of soil, air and water. What else? You know, physically, that's what we're made of. Uh, nature finds its way to balance things. Uh, I, I'm, I do Chinese medicine, I'm an acupuncturist. So yin and yang is a, is a hugely guiding philosophy for me, philosophy for me and this balance. Um, that uh, again, Rabbi Andrew Goldstein just uh, talked, talked about. Nature finds its way to balance. Rivers can meander and change course, waves mold beaches. Natural forest fires are required for regeneration. And humans alter this process. And we can alter this process with respect. But uh, as, uh, uh, yeah, and, but we can alter it uh, with exploitation. Uh, and most of us unknowingly, and uh, unknowingly are, are wrecking the planet. Um, we've we've heard about the plastic free uh, plastic free July. Uh, you know we know that plastic's made from fossil fuels. It's really good uh, to make lots of things. A lot of our clothes, a lot of people's clothes are made out of uh, plastic. It's now getting into our food, isn't it? The microplastics. Um, so we're ending up poisoning ourselves as well by eating our clothes. It seems. And I was going to say at the beginning here, actually, you know, talking on Zoom uh, is uh, it's a great opportunity, but uh, the, the, it's harder to see people's reactions and thoughts. So if anybody wants to put anything in the uh, chat column or in, the, you know, put a yes or a no or something in the um, where you can in the participants, that would just be great. And yeah, if you've got any questions that come up and then we can look at those later if we have time. I know we we. Anyway, we've heard lots of exciting things tonight. Um, when we violate earthly factors, I feel that we're violating ourselves, really. Some people champion the planet, green issues. Some people channel, ch uh, champion health. But actually, they're symbiotic. With good soil, air and water, our health thrives. With poor soil, air and water, we become un unwell and our health will suffer. We, we all know this. Um, Tell me if you don't, but you know we we've all we've all had a lovely Shabbat service where you know we're all we all know this to be true. Uh, David Attenborough wrote in 2013 State of Nature report. He said, I, I quite like his phrase here. He said, even the most casual of observers may have noticed that all is not well. <laughs> He's just so gentle, isn't he, in the way that he well used to say things. Uh, and uh, as Rabbi Andrew Goldstein has said uh, tonight, you know, the Torah is a really good study of how people lived on the land uh, and the social order that was created uh, in order to do this. Indigenous peoples, um, you know, and, and, and the Jews as they were at certain times in, in the Torah, they, you know, they lived off the land around them. There was ritual and prayer. Indigenous population studied anthropology years ago, and you know, ritual and prayer, social orders, are a massive part of how these people live on the land and make sense of the world and the universe. But I think it's also a way that the that the resources, uh, the food, etc., are become valued and become valuable. Um, and I think maybe as we've lost some of these rituals, we've lost the reverence uh, for provide for the providing forces. Uh, that exist, um, and uh, Tanya brought Tanya brought us back to the idea. You know, we had we had blessings for well, we do have blessings for every part of our day, uh, but I wonder how many of us use them for all of those things or even know them. Um, and um, one that we use a lot, in fact, we don't even use the whole prayer. Shehech Yonu is something we say when um, uh, you know when the when the first strawberry comes into the house when the first cherry off the tree or, you know, the first pea that we get to eat each season, uh, you know, that we've grown ourselves and we eat, you know, I mean, it's just wonderful. It's just, oh, 
there's, there's nothing quite like it. And um, uh, yeah, we, we, we know that, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so uh, Rabbi Tanya and uh, her enlightened son, Arthur, they, they have their own rules and rituals around food and felt moved to commit to a, I hope you don't mind me saying this, uh, well, I think Tanya knows I'm going to say this, a plant-based diet. So they've listened to their hearts and their intelligent minds and found something that they want to change, something within them. And I don't imagine that this same choice would be made uh, by other people. We all have our own choices to make. I can't imagine an Inuit family living in the Arctic in a traditional way would go for a plant-based diet. You know, they'd get pretty hungry, but they know how to live, how to balance the foods that they're eating or their, their, their communities did. 21 years ago, a group of people here made some choices and uh, they built five earth sheltered houses. I'm sitting in one of them now. So we've got uh, earth on the top, grass on the top. In fact, I've got some just berries and red currants growing above me as I sit just here now. These houses that I'm sitting in, even, even in the winter, even on a cold winter day, they need no heating. Uh, the heating all just comes directly from the sun, not by solar panels. It's just because of the, the way the houses face south facing and they're insulated. Uh, so they require much less energy. And the energy that we do use comes from renewable sources, the sun and the wind. We've got turbines and PVs. You're gonna see this all in a minute on a video. Um, the water for the houses, is collected on site. So some of it comes, so above me is the, is the earth, but just, I don't know if you can see some light coming in just to this side of me. And this is a conservatory roof, which is actually our boiler as well. But the rainwater that comes off there is the water that we use for our drinking water. And the rain that falls on the grass side, that's the water that we use for the shower and the toilet, etc. cetera. Um, and then we process uh, the waste on site, the water and the sewage, which is pro processed on site. And you'll see uh, a little bit of that uh, on this video as well. And the mission statement that they had, that we have, is to act as a, we, we moved in three years after it had been built. Um, uh, and uh, the mission statement is to act as a catalyst for change towards sustainable ways of living. So it's to act as a catalyst for change, you know, it's not to say you must do this, we must, you know, we, I feel so fortunate, this is my husband Bill, uh, we feel so fortunate to live here and, you know, be part of here. Only five houses here, you know, not everyone can live like this, M maybe one day, you know, but uh, we can all do something and uh, I really want to make sure that uh, it doesn't feel like I'm saying everyone should live like this, I'm just saying that everyone can make choices and it is possible for us in our privileged situation, I think we all are that are sitting here right now, can, if our heart's passion is there, can do, can do anything. Uh, I'm gonna pause here. Wendy, it's, uh, it's your turn now to um, play the video. There's no sound there, Wendy. No sound. Are you on mute? Okay. That's not where I live. I'd love to. <laughs> I see trees of green. Red rose. Okay, so um, I'm sure Wendy will be getting that sorted in just a minute. Uh, we don't need the music on it, Wendy. That's just fine. Um, uh, we'll get there in a mo. I'm sure. Um, so I'm just, I just, uh, I'm just waiting to see whether whether we will or not. Do you want to blame Wendy? Um, oh, here we go, here we go. Yeah. I love this Zoom stuff, it's great. There we go, nope, yeah, there we go. Okay, so it sounds like I can talk over it. 
Tanya, can you just put your thumb up if you can hear me? Yeah, great. Okay, so these are our houses. There's five houses there. That's our son cycling on his bike in front of them. On the top of the houses, you can see, uh, oh, my mouse. Can you see my mouse? Uh, we've got the PV panels here, and uh, there's Amy in the tree house. And in front of the tree house here is our reed bed, which processes all of our liquid waste, our liquid effluent. And then it comes into the lake once it's been cleaned, once it's spent 30 days in the reed bed, it comes into the lake. Here we have some wind turbines here. Uh, they're small ones. They had to be squirrel gray, the average color of the sky. Get that. Here's some polytunnels, which we grow some food. We've got more food over here and we've got other food growing areas. Um, I think that was it. Uh, so, um, yeah. Uh, you can ask questions about that if you want to later, more about it. But, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to... Tanya wants me to show you where we live. I, I love where we live, we're very lucky. And we all make choices. So I was gonna say my neighbors, they have electric cars, but we still have a diesel car. Some of my neighbors fly, some don't. Some are vegan, some aren't. There's no judgment, we all respect each other. From our known neighbor to the final few surviving, probably unknown, maybe known indigenous populations who still know how to live in harmony with the earth. So when we built the houses, uh, over the course of a year, uh, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide production associated with, uh, uh, with food production, with transport, and with the household energy costs. Uh, so, uh, what I, so people from Nottingham who came on a I don't know, we did this, some food thing before. Um, do, do, uh, okay, so how shall I phrase this, Brian? <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of energy production, uh, it, sorry, I'm just gonna take a moment. Um, it's weird not being able to hear people actually. What I'm trying to say is that, uh, if you take the amount of energy that we use in transport for, uh, and the amount of energy that we use for our households, only that equals the amount of energy that is used for our food that we eat in a household. So if we can change uh, how, what food we eat, how we eat, I mean, we've heard about people reducing the amount of waste, et cetera, um, that they have with the food, but also, you know, whether we can grow it, whether we can buy it from the green grocers. Somebody was talking about that, you know, the plastic that's associated with it. Um, it's quite massive. And uh, Benita told us about, uh, you know, the amount of food that is wasted and the, but actually if we didn't waste it, we would be able to, uh, um, uh, it would be sustainable. We do have the resources to do it. And I just wonder, you know, do we have reasons or excuses that we're not, we're not complying with the way things are? Um, we could say that it's the politicians, we could say it's the oil industry, we could say it's the supermarkets. These realms give us an easy life. It's easy. How easy is it to go and buy sugar snap pea grown using fertilizers and pesticides in Kenya, flown to the UK in an aeroplane, stored in a fridge, packaged in plastic and displayed in an air conditioned shop, which we then pick up and drive home. How much more time consuming is it for me or for you to actually grow a sugar snap pea than nip to the shop and get some? But how much impact has that choice to buy it from the supermarket made on the earth? The water, the fertilizers, the pesticides that are washed away into the water, the air, the CO2 pollutions that come from the transport and the production of the, production of the plastic, and that's even before we get into processing all of the waste. So does it still feel that it's the best option to choose the easy way to buy the sugar snap pea from Kenya than to grow our own? I'm not suggesting that we do all grow sugar snap peas, but if this becomes one of your, one of your choices, there's more about this later and you'll just need one of these and that's about it. So what I'm suggesting, as I've already said, really, is that each of us as an individual or a family or a group of friends take some time to really reflect on what we feel we can do, then we can do it. If Rabbi Tanya and Arta can do it, we can all do it. So what we all do need, though, is soil 
And soil is a massive issue right now in, in the world uh, to, to plant, you know, we, we, that was a, there was a lovely uh, prayer earlier about planting a tree. Uh, but to, and the trees, you know, they're great because they harness the, the soil, they stop it being washed away by the floods and concrete's a nightmare for soil, isn't it? I mean, it would just get run off and all the soil gets washed away. But we need soil to grow trees, we need to, soil to grow food and we need soil to grow humans. So uh, Wendy's going to show us a great another video now on um, how to make soil. Okay, so uh, yeah, I think I, you can still hear me. So that's uh, part of a tree that's wood chipping. So basically, oh, wood. Oh, right. and this is not about that, I reckon. No, it doesn't. You could, of course, eat all of these leaves, but we've got so many leaves. When you know this is going into food and soil, you can't really eat all of them. Yeah, you can't really eat all of them. Nothing there. Who doesn't find an old bit of cardboard lying around? And now we're putting another layer of green. So this is the grass cuttings. It's got a lot of water because that always quite dry. And if you've got a bit of liquid, so uh, one person's waste, a neighbour was digging out some space to make a pond. So uh, they dump their soil in the woods and we can then use that. Waste. Okay, which is composting nicely, but not ready yet. Really nice compost. This is cow manure mixed with reeds. It's a bit of an experiment, but it's come up really nice. Really David nice. Bellamy. Soil mixed with some compost. Okay, so that's how you make soil. Uh, basically, there's, there's brown stuff, we use wood chippings, then there's green stuff, which could be grass cuttings, then there's a bit more brown stuff, which maybe could be some cardboard, and then there's some more green stuff, which may be, you know, when you uh, pick a beetroot, you can eat the tops of the beetroots, or you can just put them all in as well, and you, you, you layer it up like that. And uh, obviously the nitrogen is really important, the nitrogen fix from, the, from the, the urine if you want to do that. And well, it's, it's good, compost and then compost. And that will make soil. And then, yeah, the cardboard on the top was to cover it and keep the moisture in. You've got to water it um, to allow the fungus and the, um, the fungi and uh, all the bacteria to grow in the soil and, uh, and make it all there. And um, I appreciate, I just had a chance there to read some of the comments on the, um, on the chat thing there and about, you know, this stuff is time consuming. Absolutely is time consuming. And that's what I mean. Not everyone has the time to do it. Uh, but if you do have the urge, then uh, do it. And I think actually, once you get your hands in nature, in the soil, um, we feel less exhausted from the work that we do. Definitely, that's what works uh, for me. So, um, Basically, what you can do is you put a little bit of that soil once you've made it, or you can go and get some compost from anywhere else or a molehill or something, go and dig some up from a little bit in a park somewhere maybe if you, uh, and you just put it in there, you put a pea in there and uh, the sugar snap pea will grow. There you go. And, uh, and if you could put it in a bigger pot as it grows, as your soil grows and develops, uh, that will happen. Um, what else did I want to say? I think that is, uh, I suppose talking a little bit more about the houses and as I think again somebody says on here would it not be better to get businesses to change their practice well yeah it's a really good question how do we businesses are more like tankers you know we are the sailing boats there's something each of us can do um, I, I'm sure uh, even if it's buying a pencil that you sharpen rather than a plastic propelling pencil for example you know there's there's so many different uh, little things that we can all do but um, eh, there are, maybe maybe businesses do have vested interests. Maybe they don't want to turn the tank around. Um, uh, Josie last night, she said, you know, write to our MPs, appeal to them. You know, for me, they are humans. They have families. They are individuals. They are a sailing boat. You know, maybe there's something that they will start to, uh, to, to change around. I mean, I say that, but uh, 
I have to say our local MP, Robert Jenerick, mm, interesting things on houses. He is there, isn't he? Uh, and his decisions about houses. We've invited him so many times to come here, but uh, sadly, he hasn't yet accepted our invitation. Um, however, Yvonne Cooper, when she was housing minister, Yvette Cooper, Yvette Cooper, sorry. Uh, I, I, and I, I can't remember if she was housing minister at the time or she was, anyway, she came and it was a time when David Cameron was thinking about little wind time turbines on all houses. And we were like, no, that doesn't work because, anyway, it doesn't work, but big wind turbines. Anyway, you know, she came, she came. She was, the, she was the housing minister then. She'd been here. She'd seen the insulation, what insulation's needed. And somebody's asked about how do we build the houses? And I'll tell you. Um, yeah, there, there we go. Uh, construction of the houses. Um, but uh, so, the, yeah, so the houses are basically built of, of, uh, of concrete. Concrete because it's uh, thermal mass is, what's the current word that we use for thermal mass? Uh, it's called, yeah, but there's a new trendy word. But anyway, basically it's like an old fashioned storage heater that we used to have in a cottage when we were young, you know, and uh, you put a brick next to a fire and it heats up. So we have the sun coming in from here and it heats up our brick and it can't escape because we've got polystyrene, polystyrene around the whole edge of it. So that stays in, it sinks in to the concrete and then it comes back into the house again later now i can hear you all saying oh my god concrete polystyrene these are not eco-friendly uh products absolutely they're not uh but after 12 years so there was hardly any waste there was one uh one skip full of waste from building five houses here that was it. So there wasn't much waste but yeah sure the carbon content of that was all calculated and they worked out that uh, the way these houses were lived in and with that, after 12 years, these houses would become carbon neutral. They've now been here for 21 years. So we're carbon neutral now and have been for the last quick maths, whatever that is, a few years, nine years now. So, uh, uh, so, so yes, sure, those products aren't great. If we'd built it out of wood, I mean, people love wood houses, you know, wood, wood built houses, we would still be needing to heat the house because it can't retain uh, the, the heat that's created in that same way. It can't hold that thermal mass. So yeah, back to Yvette Cooper. Um, so uh, building regs, the building regulations are created by the government and there are proposals at the moment to relax the building regulations. So to make houses less insulated, less thick walls. I mean, it's just bonkers. It's absolutely bonkers. These houses have been here for 13 years. It's nothing new, you know, indigenous, not indigenous, you know, old, older cultures in Spain. You know, you go into the houses there and they're freezing cold in the summer because they're thick, they're solid walls. Um, and, you know, these are basic houses in the mountains where, um, you know, cheap, cheap to build. And what are we doing? Why are we doing it in the way that we is? We, we, we are, is it, it, you know, vested, again, I come back to vested interest by business, but we have to keep trying talking to politicians, don't we? We absolutely have to keep trying to politicians, but, and put the moral compass onto businesses. Um, but we can do that. We can do that. Every penny that we spend, uh, uh, sorry, I'm aware of time now, so I'm just gonna make one little last point, um, but uh, we all spend money and each penny that we spend is a buying choice. And we can really think about that. Uh, I think all employers now have to provide pensions. We have, you know, pensions have to be had. Who is your pension company? Pension companies are a massive buying power, absolutely massive. They are the tankers. Well, they, they, they are the fuel for the tankers. Pension companies invest in businesses. So if we find out who our pension is held with, where is our pen where is that money for our pension? And make sure that that's in companies where we can make sure that they're in companies that aren't doing harm, but we could also move to, pen to companies that we want to promote. So yeah, we have, we have power in that way and we can change the, uh, we, we can change in many ways. The other thing that I heard today that made me just chuckle really was about, um, we try and change the politicians, we try and change the politics and we try and do that. And then Boris has come back to newt counting to try and distract from all the houses and the environmental stuff. And that made me really sad really today, but pleased that we've got this green Shabbat to counteract that. And I can see some questions coming in on the side now. So I'm gonna stop for a moment and let Tanya say something or read these things. Thank you so yeah, much. Well, everyone has just said, Louise, that, that was that was fascinating. I think you know, one thing for all of us to do small little things and make our our life 
a sustainable living, but it's completely different to listening to you and seeing how it's done in real life. First of all, it is possible. Secondly, it's interesting that you said it's not easy at times. I think it's because we are very much humans, we are creatures of habit. It's about changing the way we think and changing our priorities. And I can speak for myself. Since the lockdown, I started my own herbal garden on my balcony. And first everyone kind of found it really funny, but now it's like a beautiful little garden and it produces a lot of kale, which I've been, I've been eating with my meals regularly, almost on a daily basis. And it's got lots of other, lots of other herbs and uh, some vegetables, which were given to me by different members of our community. And that sense of growing something from a seed and seeing it growing and flourishing, it connects you to the nature, but also makes, makes me so appreciative of, of, of consuming it that every single time when I take a few leaves of any herbs or kale or radish or a spinach, I say thank you. And that's changing in my attitude of always being busy, 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 and there is never time. And just realizing that if I want to make a difference to the world, I have to do it now. And I think that's, that's what your talk, Louise, was about. And you and Bill and other families in Hoppington Housing Project is a real inspiration to all of us. So thank you so much for your presentation, it was brilliant. Um, and I just have to say, Tanya, you are the busiest person that anybody in Nottingham knows. And if you can do it, absolutely anyone can do it. <laughs> have, has anyone, thank you, Louise, has anyone got any question to ask, to ask Louise or Bill? Has anyone got a question or make a comment? Uh, Jeff, Jeff, please, could you please unmute yourself? Hi. Hi, hi. I think Hopkinton's an amazing place. I visited about 15 years ago, and I was impressed so much with your electric car that now I've got one. You inspired me. Now I've got a Nissan Leaf and uh, all electric car, and I think it's from you that I got that. But you started this 20 years ago, and nobody heard of global warming. Nobody heard of carbon capture at that time. So I was just wondering what inspired you to do it. That's that's one question. And the second question is. I want to see Bill's T-shirt. He's got a tree there and something underneath it. That's amazing. So that's the second question. <laughs> so two questions. Okay. Uh, well, Jeff, shall I just say about my T-shirt? I literally went in the cupboard today and it's the first one I pulled out and it just happens to be one with a tree on and a world. So uh, there was no thinking behind this, but it's quite appropriate, isn't it, I suppose, for tonight? And it says, feed the world, I think, at the bottom. Feed the world. Uh, feed the world. Where did it come from? I don't know. <laughs> is that one from Gemma? Anyway, no, I don't know. So, so the question is, what, what inspired you 20 years ago? What year? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what inspired us or what inspired uh, the project to be built? Because we actually but, came in three years after that. Yeah, but, well, well, you, you know, yeah. Us, yeah. us. Okay, so, so us, we... Um, uh, well, what inspired me? I, I, have you got time for this? Just <laughs> no, keep, um, it keep it short. Um, it's really hard. Okay. Um, I, I went I... to Nepal. I, I went to Nepal in a, in a gap year and uh, in the mountains. Uh, I, was, I was in the mountains in the 80s and there were people there who were so uh, so poor, it appeared to me so poor, materially poor, they had nothing, they were, had bare feet, but they were so happy. The contentment and the, the beauty of their beings absolutely struck me, bowled me over. It was, it was something I had not, you know, I'd grown up in sheltered Nottingham, uh, sh you know, sheltered, sheltered life. And, uh, and, and, for me, it was like, I didn't know that you were allowed to be happy without money. I didn't know it could happen. You know, it wasn't part of what I thought was there. And, and then I had to go, uh, then I, uh, so I, I don't know whatever course I was supposed to go on when I came back from my gap year, but I had to go off and study at Geography and Anthropology at Oxford Polytechnic uh, to understand how people lived on the land, uh, you know, how, how that interaction, that that's, uh, sustainability happened, that resource. And there, that's where Bill and I met. And uh, there was a, an inspiring lecturer there called Alan Jenkins, who 
uh, he could see what was to come. So this is this is in the 80s. And, you know, James Lovelock's Gaia theory was, you know, that was fairly new and it was all like exciting. I mean, I think he's out of favor now. Uh, you know, we and 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 this guy. Uh, well, do you want to say what he did? Yeah, we, we both went on a field trip uh, or at, uh, separate times but to a place called the Centre for Alternative Technology, CAT in Wales, that some of you might have heard of. And uh, yeah, we did this field trip as part of our geography course. And this community was based in a, an old quarry and they were living sustainably. So they had turf roofed houses, um, highly insulated. They lived off the land as much as they could, grew, grew most of their own crops. They had wind turbines. PV panels, they collected their own water, composting toilets. And uh, even then as students, where well, that didn't sort of figure on my radar at all at the time, but having spent a, a week there, I came away thinking, you know what, this really makes sense. You know, treading lightly on the planet and, and uh, just uh, using all these resources in, a, in an environmental friendly way seemed to tick all the boxes for me. and. I came away thinking at some point in my life, I want to do this. I don't know how, I don't know what shape or form it would take, but this is what I really want to do. And uh, here we are, I don't know, that was probably 30, 30, 30, 30, 20, well, 20 years after that, we've ended up here. So, 30. Um, or 30, <laughs> all right. A long time, anyway, it's happened. And, but, and Jeff, what, 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 a, a cat, uh, the Centre for Technical Technology. I remember, obviously, we were students. You know, we took hair dryers. You put one hair dryer in, and it blew the whole system. Where like twenty students were being accommodated. You know, energy uh, was. You know, renewable energy was quite a new thing then, but it was possible so long as you didn't use high energy items. I, I mean, it's just yeah, it's great. I, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. But the, and the project was inspired by um, uh, two architects, Robert and Brenda Vale. And uh, a few years ago, we found an article that they'd written in the 70s with a picture of their envisaged place like that. In fact, uh, Brenda Vale wrote like um, a utopian novel. Um, and um, uh, but, but this was based on that. So they've had this idea since the 70s. And finally, an opportunity came to build it. And I just see a question here in the chat uh, from Alfie about... Um, uh, no details about the finance and the planning permissions. And I mean, that's an absolutely fascinating part of this. Uh, have I got time to mention that bit, Tanya? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this was built on a greenfield site. Um, and, uh, and the reason it was built on a greenfield site is because um, we had to have associated with it because it was going to be sustainable and uh, what's called a 106 agreement. So an agreement that went with the building of the houses, which said, uh, which gave us conditions that meant that it had to be sustainable. So we have to provide employment on site. We have to be employed on site. So that was to stop us commuting great distances, say to, to London or whatever, you know, we had to provide employment on site. Each household is only allowed one fossil fuel car per family. And that's caused quite a lot of challenges over the years for various people. I mean, now electric cars are much more available, but you know, so obviously we've got car shares and bicycles and all these things. Um, and the land had to be managed in a, um, okay. no, orga well, organically in a biodiversity way. Um, and, but it did take a long time to get planning permission. It was really tricky. They made models of the houses and, um, and we were very lucky and it happened. And the finance of it, yeah, finance is absolutely always an issue. Um, uh, these houses are actually very cheap to build compared to other houses. Um, and um, of course it still costs, of course it still costs, of course it's still expensive, but you know, they are simple, they're straightforward. And it was a self-built project and the families that were here at the time lived in caravans uh, while they were here, uh, while they were building, etc. Thank you very much, Louise. I'm sure we've got many more questions to ask, but unfortunately we run out of time, but so exciting and interesting was the conversation. I would like, I would like to thank Louise very, very much and Bill. It was fascinating to see the actual, the actual Ica village. I like calling it Ica village. It brings some, some very nice, you know, um, feelings of, of countryside. 
uh, from, from you both. So that was lovely. Thank you very much. And I would like now to say a big, big thank you, first of all, to all of you for joining us today to celebrate our first liberal green Shabbat. I also would like to thank my colleagues, all the wonderful rabbis who joined us tonight and helped and helped with the service and particularly Rabbi Richard Jacobi, who produced the booklet for mm -hmm. our service tonight. It was a real pleasure working with them together. I would love to thank our fantastic lay leaders from all, all the eight communities. It was wonderful to have you in the service and to be inspired by you as well. And how lucky we are to have you in our communities and how lucky we are to have you caring about the world around us. I also would love to thank you so, so many other people who made this, this service possible. And first of all, of course, I would like to thank our tech guru, Leo Mendel. Thank you so, so much, Leo, for joining us. And also, I mean, I can see Rabbi Richard is clapping. Leo, this is for you. Thank you so much. And I would love to thank our inspirational, fantastic speakers for tonight, Benita Mankowski first, and then Rabbi Andrew Goldstein and Louise Lipman with Bill Bolton. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your stories. And this is to our first Green Shabbat and hopefully not the last one. We've been celebrating it to that tonight and the action hopefully will follow by being inspired by our speakers, being inspired by our speakers. Thank you so, so much, everyone. We will finish our event now, but we will finish completely, completely our service with a video, with a video just as we started our service, just in a minute. And while we are preparing the video, I would like to wish you Shabbat Shalom, have a restful and a peaceful Shabbat, and I'll send you all the green vibes. Shabbat Shalom. Very big thank you to Rabbi Tanya for her inspirational leadership making the evening happening to happen as well. Thank you, Tanya. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you very much, Richard. Shabbat Shalom. A long day shouldn't stop you from showing up. You got this television. Clearly that wasn't what was meant to happen. We were hoping <laughs> that Edinburgh's dulcet tones would see us out into the evening. I hope we will get that. It, it, just give me one minute, sorry. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue clouds of white, bright blessed days, dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colours of a rainbow, so pretty in the sky also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more. Ever know, and I think to myself, 
What a wonderful world. Quite simply, wonderful. And uh, we come to the end of our evening together. Wish you all a peaceful night and an enjoyable rest of Shabbat. Thank you again, Rabbi Tanya. Thank you, Thank you for your hosting.